from Las Vegas. Then we'll move to item 10 and then nine, and then note that the field trip is canceled. Thank you. Do I have a second? I have a second from Vice Chair Cavilia. So we have a motion to approve the agenda with the noted changes. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Weiss absent. Okay. Uh, agenda item number three, approval of the minutes. Chairwoman East for possible action. Commission minutes for the, from the March 25 and 26, 2022 meeting may be approved. Do we have any comments on the minutes? Yes, Commissioner McNinch. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Damn, was it on? <laughs> um, I had a, I had a couple of uh, quick, um, quick things. I guess the, the grammar check or whatever. It's anyway. Um, on page three, the very last sentence refer, uh, it's referring to Granite uh, Peak Ranch instead of Peel Peak. Ranch. And on page 69, um, the, second, the second paragraph that starts with John Hyatt, um, one to the third line, uh, I'm sorry, on the second line, there's a reference to BLM Southern Great Basin RAC. I think that should be uh, RAC, uh, Resource Advisory Council <clears throat> or Committee. <clears throat> Um, just directly below that, another one, two, three, four, five, six lines. Um, there's a the, the line that starts with estimate. He pointed out that the BLM has zeroed out, so the herd management, um, H-E-R-D, I guess. I just caught that, so I thought I'd mention it. And then on page 76, um, under the last sentence under item number 17, uh, there's a reference to the Licking Ranch, and it's uh, it it states Lithium Ranch, so yeah. probably ought to. Okay. We might have some Lithium Ranches up there sooner <laughs> or later, but for now, I think anyway. So that was those were my comments. Okay. Anyone else have changes or comments, Commissioner Barnes? <laughs> There you go. Um, I'm going to be abstaining from the vote on the minutes since I was absent at the last meeting. Okay. Any other changes? Okay, this is an approval item or an action item, so we'll take it out for public comment. Do we have any public comment on our minutes in Washoe County? Okay, I don't see any. How about on Zoom? Nope, no public comments. Okay, I'll bring it back for a motion to approve. Motion. Vice Chair Cavilia. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as presented with the noted changes. Okay. Do I have a second? <laughs> second by Commissioner Perini. So we have a motion to approve the minutes of our March 25, 26 meeting. Right. I want to make sure those dates are right. Yes. Uh, with the noted changes. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Commissioner Barnes is abstaining and Commissioner Weiss is absent. Okay, agenda item number four. And if you didn't see the agenda items, uh, agendas and the uh, items related to it there at the back, I apologize for not mentioning that before. Um, agenda item number four, member items, announcements and correspondence, Chairwoman East, informational. 
Commissioners may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. The commission will review and may discuss correspondence sent or received by the commission since the last regular meeting and may provide copies for the exhibit file. Commissioners may provide hard copies of their correspondence for the written record. Correspondence sent or received by Secretary Wosley may also be discussed. I have two uh, letters that I will read into the record tomorrow, but I just wanted to let everybody know that we have, uh, I have two letters that have asked, been asked to be um, recorded with our meeting tomorrow. Um, I have, a, I just wanna thank uh, Mr. Bunch and the Mineral County Search and Rescue Organization. They were very instrumental. In fact, they were the people who found the couple that had disappeared out at um, Silver Peak. And um, they don't get enough recognition. And I think it's just phenomenal that the that we our search and rescue folks were able to find that couple a week after they had been reported missing, um, that they got it called the day ahead and they were able to locate them within 24 hours. So I just, if we could just give them a round of applause, I'd really appreciate it. You bet, thanks, Glenn. Um, that was all I had. Secretary Wosley, any correspondence? Uh, no, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay. Uh, agenda item number five, the County Advisory Boards to Manage Wildlife Member Items Informational. CAB members may present emergent items by raising their hand in the virtual forum. Well, we're not in the virtual forum. Um, no action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action will be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Do we have any CAB items? No? We're in person. <laughs> Come on down. Hello. Okay. Uh, Worth Nelson, Lander Cab. I was sent with a letter here that I'd like to read to you real quick if I could. Dear Andow Commissioners, the Lander County Wildlife Advisory Board is writing to you with a concern. We would like this letter to be read during public comment at the state meeting if May, in May, if possible. Our concern is that for more than five years, our board has been requesting that a youth antelope hunt be added to our areas. This hunt would be beneficial because it could be an easier and more enjoyable hunt and we feel that with success, it will entice the youth to continue to hunt and enjoy the outdoors. We feel that we have the antelope population to support this. We have emailed asking about such a hunt. We have attended different meetings prior to COVID and Zoom meetings and have asked for it to be considered during public comment. However, we have not had any luck. This past season, Endow added a muzzleloader hunt to these areas, yet we still have no youth hunt. We are asking once again for the board to strongly consider adding a youth antelope hunt in areas 151 through 156, 141, and 143. We appreciate you taking the time to hear and or read this, and hopefully you will consider our request. We would also ask that you email our secretary that you received and or listened to this request. Her email is sondertorgeson at gmail.com. Sincerely, Lander County Wildlife Advisory Board. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Will you hand that over to Missy so that she has it for the record? Yes. Thank you. Any other cap comment? Nope, okay, we'll move on then. Uh, agenda item number six reports informational 6A, department activity report, secretary Wosley and division administrators. A report will be provided on the Nevada Department of Wildlife Activities. It will. There we go. <clears throat> Apparently, I don't have enough blood circulating to my fingers. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll kick this off, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, staff from the Governor's Finance Office. We had two members from the Governor's Finance Office and two members from the Legislative Council Bureau Fiscal Analysis Division that joined our uh, leadership team meeting on Monday, April 25th. So partly due to uh, 
a regular turnover at both Governor's Finance and, and LCB, partly due to challenges of the pandemic, partly due to the uniqueness of our funding and our mission within state government. Uh, we're, we're always trying to achieve a better understanding of the agency and the specific programs that for which each division is responsible. So we had um, the benefit of having four individuals, two from, from each of those entities join us and, and spent over three hours walking through uh, the agency mission and division by division uh, breakdown and, and update. Uh, management analyst Kaylee Musso presented to the Nevada Indian Commission on Monday, April 25th, uh, after she received a request from them to hear more about what the department does and request uh, more information specifically on Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Uh, as most of you are aware, Recovering America's Wildlife Act has now passed through the Environment and Public Works Subcommittee in the Senate and the House uh, Natural Resource Committee. So we're hopeful that the bill will be brought forward to floor votes in, in both uh, the House and the Senate uh, in, the, in the coming months. Uh, the, the deadline, um, unofficial deadline, the hopeful deadline was Memorial Day. So we still have our, our fingers crossed. Wednesday afternoon, uh, Nevada Senator Catherine Cortez Masto was officially added as co-sponsor in the Senate, which brings the total along with uh, a senator from New Jersey, brings that total to 34 co-sponsors in, in the Senate. Um, and there's uh, roughly equal numbers of Democrats and, and Republicans. Uh, the last thing from the director's office, I just wanted to share that uh, last, last night, both uh, Kaylee Musso, our legislative liaison, and myself returned uh, from Washington, D.C. We, we had the opportunity to meet with uh, either every member or staff from every member of Nevada's congressional delegation, as well as some uh, key staff in the Department of Interior, uh, staff from the National Wildlife uh, Foundation, uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, um, as well as a number of, of NGOs, uh, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency staff and, and others. Um, it was a great opportunity to raise awareness and stress the importance of several conservation challenges in Nevada, including sagebrush biome, sage grouse, uh, wild horses and burrows and opportunities in Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Talked about the challenges with the drought, um, horses, water, uh, a myriad of issues, uh, very, very productive um, meetings and had a very, very full schedule. So that concludes the update from the director's office. And with that, I would turn the floor over to game division administrator, Mike Scott, um, to kick off the division reports. Does anybody have questions for Secretary Wasley? Director Wasley? No, okay. Good morning. Madam Chair, members of the commission, for the record, Mike Scott, Game Division Administrator. Uh, Game Division was recently involved in a west-wide published report by the USGS titled Ungulate Migrations of the Western United States, Volume 2. That includes maps and summaries of 65 big game migration routes in Arizona, California, Idaho, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, Washington, and the Wind River Indian Reservation and Wyoming. Nevada has collaborated with California to map three new interstate mule deer herds, the Carson River Interstate, Truckee Verdi Interstate, and Loyalton Truckee Subherd, as well as an interstate pronghorn herd, the Sheldon Hart Mountain. Pronghorn migration is highlighted in the report. Game Division staff contributed a significant amount of time to the development of Sagebrush Conservation Strategy Part 2, Strategies for Sagebrush Conservation. This 233-page document is out for review and will be published this year. The strategies address a comprehensive set of threats to the sagebrush ecosystem throughout its range and will be published by USGS. Game Division staff recently completed federally required reporting of swan harvest from the recent season and submitted the recently approved 2022-2023 waterfowl seasons to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for federal approval. The Wildlife Health Program continues to monitor the highly pathogenic avian influenza situation across North America and remains vigilant for reports of wild bird die-offs. Along those lines, staff worked with USDA APHIS Wildlife Services and jointly decided that to make certain we do not spread any unknown pool, unknown pool of HPAI, 
<clears throat> to abandon the, Cal the Canada Goose Roundups in the Truckee Meadows for 2022. Uh, the Bighorn and Mountain Goat Staff Specialist attended the Biennial Northern Wild Sheep and Goat Council Symposium hosted by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department in early April. The bigger challenges and opportunities that many agencies are facing throughout the West, including Canada, are continued domestic sheep and wild, wild sheep interaction, more test and remove projects, initiated to clear herds of pneumonia, growing impacts of high elevation outdoor recreation, especially on mountain goats, realized impacts of climate change on mountain goat and thin horn sheep herds with parallels to the impacts we see on bighorn sheep in the Mojave Desert and Great Basin of erratic and inconsistent temperature swings and moisture patterns and increased use of technology and genetics in monitoring mountain ungulates, their pathogens and their habitat use. <clears throat> Working closely with Utah Division of Wildlife Resources to conduct early summer muddy mountain desert bighorn capture for Utah's newly established nursery site for use as translocation stock in Utah. In March, Game Division staff received notification that the department was selected to receive a special achievement in GIS SAG award at the 2022 ESRI User Conference for recent implementation of the Wildlife Survey app for data collection during big game surveys. The department was selected from more than 100,000 other organizations from around the world in recognition of outstanding work with GIS technology. The, the Wildlife Survey app has received considerable attention and promotion from ESRI, including blog, blog posts, publication in ESRI's government newsletter, and a video project currently in production. The success of the Wildlife Survey app would not have been possible without helpful collaboration from game division biologists, including ideas, feedback, and a willingness to try something new. Primary funding for development and maintenance of the Wildlife Survey app was provided by the Wildlife Heritage Trust account, Project 2009. <clears throat> from our Southern region, uh, Southern region staff conducted spring mule deer and sage grouse lek surveys in management areas 16 and 17 during the week of March 28th. Surveys yielded a sample size of 191 deer in management area 16 with 19 fawns per 100 adults and 519 deer in management area 17 with a ratio of 27 fawns per 100 adult. Unprecedented drought conditions experienced in 2020 and 2021 and concurrent poor habitat conditions are two reasons that explain the depressed fawn recruitment observed while on survey. These data are indicating population level contractions which will affect quota recommendations. Sage grouse lek surveys conducted in central Nevada, management areas 16 and 17, yielded to ten, attendance rates well below the 10 year average. However, the numbers are a slight uptick from last year's counts. In the eastern region, uh, eastern region personnel wrapped up winter elk and spring deer surveys recently. Survey results varied widely across the eastern region, with some areas, particularly in the northern and central portion of the region, showing promising trends in recruitment and overall health of mule deer and elk populations. Unfortunately, populations in the southeastern portion of the region are struggling with impacts of ongoing severe drought conditions. A combined total of over 19,000 deer were classified during spring deer surveys in the eastern region with an average observed fawn to adult ratio of 32 fawns per 100 adults. Elk surveys yielded a combination of over 7,500 elk classified as an observed ratio of 42 bulls per 100 cows and 38 calves per 100 cows. Sage grouse lek surveys are continuing in the eastern region, but preliminary data shows some of the areas of increased attendance over the rates observed last year, but numbers remain well below long term averages overall. From the western region, western region personnel have finalized aerial surveys for sage grouse, deer, and elk. A total of 242 leks have been surveyed from the air while ground-based surveys will continue throughout the spring to monitor lek attendance. Black bears have begun to emerge from dens across the western portion of the state, beginning their search for sustenance. Conflict calls and incidents have been slowly increasing over the past two months and are anticipated to continue at moderate levels throughout summer. Endow staff has coordinated with Nevada Department of State Parks and TNC to minimize impacts by beavers within the western region. Beaver dams have been manipulated to increase water flows and re reduce property damage while maintaining habitat conditions for aquatic species. Staff has been coordinating with private landowners, BIA and livestock operators 
to reduce or remove conflicts between domestic live livestock and wild sheep throughout the region. And finally, the game division has assisted the habitat division and uh, Nevada Bighorns Unlimited with guzzler builds in Mineral, Churchill, Humboldt, and Persian counties. Two of the five units have been completed with additional construction slated throughout the coming months. And that concludes my report, but I would be happy to answer any questions. That's a lot. You guys have been busy. Congratulations on the award. Thank you. Those yeah, Cody nice McKee is, is chiefly responsible for that, but a lot of staff participated. And uh, uh, you will be seeing a video before too long on it. Um, they've done a, an excellent video. It's, it's very encouraging. So Great. Anyway. Any questions for Mr. Scott? Commissioner Rogers? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Scott, you mentioned in your report just, and I'm, I apologize, I must have just missed it, but you mentioned something about uh, the state of Utah and, and their nursery group and captures in, in uh, the muddies. What, what was the report there on that? Yeah, Commissioner Rogers, um, Mike Scott, for the record, uh, we are going to try something new this year. We are going to try a summer capture for bighorn sheep in the muddies, and they are going to be going to Utah. They have a a fenced area that they're going to use. It's a, a large fenced area that they're going to use as a, a captive um, area for, for translocation stock. So they're going to take these sheep and they're not going to be hunted in this, this area. They're just going to be able to remove animals from there and, and move them throughout Utah. And th since they're clean sheep, there should be no interaction with, with any domestic uh, sheep or goats. So the disease risks are, are minimized. This is already happening in, I believe New Mexico has this and Utah is trying to follow what they've done. So uh, anyway. It, is there a target number of sheep that you're looking to take out of there to, for this relocation we're, to Utah? Yeah, we're gonna take 30 sheep. And I believe it's, I think we're gonna try it in June. Is that, yeah, June. So um, if you have any further questions, uh, Joe Bennett from the Southern region is here and he can, he can answer additional questions on that if, if necessary. Any other questions for Mr. Scott? Did you have something secretary Wasley? Oh, I thought I saw you. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Chairwoman East and members morning. of the commission, Alan Janae, Habitat Division Chief. Um, in the Habitat Division, the Water Development Program, the Southern Region crew has largely completed their volunteer build season with the construction of a supplemental water source in Valley of Fire State Park. The Valley of Fire project will provide supplemental water to desert bighorn sheep in the muddy mountains during periods of extreme drought. This unit is plumbed into the state park's water system and already had approximately 3,000 gallons available for sheep within two days of completion. Annual maintenance flights inspected approximately 70 units and resulted in a mixed bag of water supply going into the summer. Many units are already less than 50% of capacity and would require supplemental water. Endow is currently coordinating, um, coordinating priority needs and will be conducting water hauls in the very near future. The Northern Water Development crew is midway through their volunteer season and has an upcoming build in the North Valley uh, or the North Valley unit on May 14th. Habitat Conservation Framework Project Portal. Endow has implemented a new website and database for managing projects, including those funded by the special reserve accounts, such as Heritage Trust Account, Duck Stamp, Upland Neighborhood, and Habitat Conservation Fee. Applications for the 2023 funding will be submitted using this new system, and Endow has plans to continue developing this new project management tool throughout the year. Technical review. Pardon me, page jump. The technical review program activities include an ongoing development of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Greater Sage Grouse Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances and providing ongoing administration of the Energy Planning and Conservation Fund and the Fund for the Recovery of Costs, um, the AB 307 bill um, from years ago. During the last 16 months, 53 applications were submitted for following energy development projects in Nevada. Five transmission lines, one wind project, 13 solar facilities, and eight other types of projects such as energy storage facilities were submitted. 
This is the largest number of energy development applications the program has received in a reporting period since the program was created. One of the major developments occurring in Nevada regarding energy development is the conglomeration of multiple projects into a single complex. We are, we are seeing this occurring right now with seven solar projects outside of Tonopah. These projects are being analyzed under one single EIS, Environmental Impact Statement, covering all projects. Project planning and coordination is occurring simultaneously and taking considerable time and resources from our staff for participating in the National Environmental Policy Act analysis planning efforts. We anticipate this project to occur more frequently with Green Link West and Green Link North transmission lines coming online and have already been seeing increased number of interest from developers um, reaching out to Endow in, in consideration of those projects. Sagebrush Ecosystem Technical Team. The Endow representative on the Sagebrush Ecosystem Technical Team was recently involved in a, a meeting of the science work group to further discuss and examine a strategic approach to developing an effective method to analyze and mitigate for debit projects that are anticipated to cause lack extirpation from direct and indirect impacts of proponent operations. The set is considering integrating sage grass population data into the habitat quantification tool process to prioritize habitat uplift sites that could benefit from sage grass source populations in real time. The Sagebrush Ecosystem Technical Team has recently run the habitat quantification tool for an alternative route for the Green Link North project that runs across I-80 instead of Highway 50. The I-80 alternative route accrued 4.5 times the debit amount than did the initial proposed Highway 50 route. And that is primarily due to the uh, co-location with an existing power line going across 50. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Wow, any questions for Mr. Janae? No? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Chris Vasey, for the record, Conservation Education Chief. Um, be my pleasure to bring to you our classroom programming and events. Um, start with the classroom programming. Teachers continue to support, submit projects for wildlife badge pilot. Uh, we had our first classroom qual uh, qualify for the reptiles badge in April. This program is aligned to the K-12 standards and offers three different badges that, that classrooms can earn flora, reptiles, and adventure badge. Teachers are required to attend training for the program and then facilitate it through their classrooms at their own pace. We are ramping, ramping up ex excitement for our annual free fishing day poster contest. The contest is open to all fourth and fifth grade students in Nevada and allows the department to con connect directly with our young generations of outdoor enthusiasts. The winner of this contest will have their artwork printed posters that will be hung in the schools and government offices across the state. Conservation Education in Reno facilitated its first Project Wild workshop in partnership with NDEP. Project Wet State Coordinator, the workshop was for AmeriCorps serving in different sites throughout Reno and Carson City area. 29 people attended and two day workshop on April 12th through 13th. They're now certified to teach both Project Wild affiliated program and Project Wet. Events, we're preparing for our ongoing volunteer academy. This is where we take our instructors, our volunteer instructors, angler ed, wildlife ed, hunter ed instructors, and we take them through a series of um, trainings. And then we also uh, rec recognize them for the past year's um, uh, results. Clark, Clark County Fair took place on April 6th and 10th and was a great success. This year, conservation educators, as well as support from game, habitat, diversity, and law enforcement were there to support many educational tables and outdoor activities. More than 109,000 visitors took this opportunity to fish, shoot archery, meet some of the native reptiles of the Mojave. Many volunteers supported this effort, as well as many hours and miles were collected to be used for our grant match. Conservation educators presented at a local Earth Day events, April 22nd through 24th in Western Region. Educators will be at the Animal Ark throughout that weekend, 
for the Earth Day event. Southern Region educators were spread out on the 23rd, helping with Earth Day Bio Blitz, the Valley of Fire Spring Preserve, as well as helping Lake Mead with the Junior Ranger Day. Outreach, conservation education staff continue to promote the Big Game application period through emails and social media posts. As the application deadline gets closer, about two emails will be going out per, well, went out per week, and now we're, we're daily, along with countdown emails on the final five days to our customers who have not applied. You may have received one of those recently. Uh, conservation education staff produced an outreach for department's new shed hunting class and, and certification. Staff created social media posts, website content, and took part in a radio segment with KOH News to spread the word. Total number of class participants and completions since la the launch is 1,737. Of those, um, there were 64% are residents, 36% were non-residents. And as a side note, um, I just put this down, 24% of those non-residents were in Utah. Media highlights, Volunteer Appreciation Month, social media posts and podcasts have been rolling out month with lots of great reception. We highlighted some of our rock star volunteers and posting and recruiting new volunteers for project as, as, and as instructors. Endow staff has worked on various press releases, including announcement of bipartisan bill, which is the uh, RAWA, Recovering America's Wildlife, and it passed another step. And the biologists worked to monitor fish die off and wild horse reservoir. Public information officers also resumed an education monthly Wildlife Wednesday segment with KOLO8 news covering different wildlife related topics. This month, they, took, they talked about spring bear activity, Endow's involvement in the National Wildlife national wide bear wise campaign to standardize bear awareness messaging across the country and tips to live responsibly in bear country. According to the services staff use, uses to track mention the news in February, the department has reached an audience of 21,783 on TV, 264,188 on radio and a 6 million online and print news this month. In March, the department has had TV audience of 167,000 um, and an audience of 533,000 online print audience and of 6 million. And I'll take any questions. Any questions for Mr. Vasey, Commissioner Keel? Yeah, Mr. Vasey, just a clarification on the percentage of the, the shed hunter. So was it? 24% of the total were Utah applications or 24% of the 36% resident? The non-resident of, of who completed the coursework and non-resident was made up 24% were Utah. Gotcha. Yep. Appreciate that. And I have other numbers. There was Idaho was 7%, California was 2%. Have, if you haven't taken the certification. It's actually really interesting. I, I spent a few minutes a couple of weeks ago and did it. And uh, I learned a little bit of, of information, which I thought was fun. And um, then I could see what people are, are talking about. So if you haven't done it, I would highly encourage it. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning. I'm Jen Newmark. I'm Wildlife Diversity Division Administrator. Uh, wildlife Diversity Biologists recently finalized the Nevada Pika Atlas, which is a compilation of all the known data for the species within the state through 2019. The American Pika is a Nevada species of greatest conservation need, as well as a Nevada BLM sensitive species, and is a concern given its sensitivity to climate change and evidence of recent range retractions particularly in our area. A local or a total of 79 mountain ranges had available pika information with 22 of these ranges being considered currently occupied. Another range was considered possibly occupied while nine ranges had pika populations that were presumed to be recently extirpated. Furthermore, 44 ranges had areas that were surveyed but had no evidence of pikas detected, and these ranges are presumed to be unoccupied in recent dec decades. 
The Nevada pika atlas is expected to inform management and research regarding the species, um, document the known distribution and status of the pikas in our state, and we consider it a living document where we'll be trying to update it every five years. It's also available on our website in full, which is really nice. So you can just search pika and you'll find it right there. It's a great product and I'm really proud of my staff for working so hard on it. Um, in other areas, wildlife diversity is working with the habitat division on renewable energy projects, particularly in the Tonopah area, which you also just heard uh, Administrator Janae already speak about. Um, these uh, we're focusing on the projects around Green Link West and North transmission lines, um, photovoltaic solar plants, geothermal plants, and then lithium exploration and mining. Most of these projects are in valley bottoms in desert scrub and sagebrush habitats with the potential impacts to pale and dark kangaroo mice, um, which are Nevada state listed threatened species, desert horn lizards and others. And then it's also areas that are foraging habitats for various raptors, including golden eagles and migratory birds and lots of other species too. Um, in ESA listing activities, the Western Pond Turtle is currently under review for Endangered Species Act listing with an expected decision by September of this year. Wildlife diversity biologists have spent the past seven years collecting data on the species in Western Nevada, which was provided to the service earlier this year to assist in their listing decision. Endow has been closely engaged with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listing team and multiple state and federal partner agencies in a proactive effort to model suitable habitat, identify threats and conservation needs, and develop a management strategy for western pond turtles across their range. The California spotted owl will be undergoing a second review for ESA listing. The not warranted decision from November of 2019 was challenged in court and the service is now required to reevaluate the species and issue a new listing decision by February of 2023. NDAO will be providing new data to assist this effort, including additional survey data and a first of its kind habitat model for spotted owls in the Carson range that was recently developed with UNR and that you heard about at the, our last commission meeting. Finally, the department was recently notified by Defenders of Wildlife that they intend to petition the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to list the pinyon jay as endangered or threatened. This species is included in our state wildlife action plan and staff are currently conducting preliminary surveys and starting to kind of get our heads around what that status of that species is in central Nevada. Um, and that concludes my report. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Questions for Ms. Newmark? Commissioner McNinch, no? <laughs> well, no. Um, okay. <laughs> we, we talked about the Pinion J at the Heritage Committee briefly last night. And, um, you know, basically I asked a question about how, you know, with all the Pinion Juniper removal projects, how, how are, you know, the Pinion Juniper obligates, how are they considered? And, you know, there's a balance there. And, uh, um, was it Moira? Is that who it was? Yeah. Okay. Um, you shared with us how you know how the department you know uh, goes through those considerations because I know the pinion jays and there's probably a number of other um, pinion obligates that are you know they're impacted by by these things and there are concerns already um, before any of these projects have even been done. So um, you know I appreciated the the input that there they are considered. There's considerations are taken into. Um, you know they're evaluated and, and thrown into the into the work. So when we're when we're doing these projects, you know we're not sacrificing one species to the benefit of another. They're they're we're trying to maintain that balance. So I appreciated that. So didn't really have any questions. I'm excited about Rawa. I didn't say it when Tony mentioned it because I thought I'd just sit here quietly, but that's a big deal. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Thanks, Ms. Newmark. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to do the fisheries division activity report. We don't have anybody here from the fisheries division today. Before I do, I'm just going to backpedal a little bit um, and provide some additional 
updates, one perhaps specific to diversity in that the Fish and Wildlife Service just recently released California condors in Northern California. Uh, and just so folks here are aware, about four or five years ago, uh, maybe, maybe less, but um, the Fish and Wildlife Service approached us and asked if we would be interested in establishing what's known as a 10J uh, rule under the Endangered Species Act. And what a 10J essentially says is that a population is experimental and non-essential to the core of the population. And so the Northern Nevada, um, certainly Northwestern Nevada is covered under a 10J rule so that through this, it, this reintroduction of condors in Northern California. If any of those condors should happen to make their way into the Great Basin, uh, they are considered um, experimental, non-essential. And so should there be uh, any kind of incidental take, then individuals would not be um, responsible as they might for something that isn't clarified or classified as a experimental, uh, non-essential part of a population, but uh, exciting nonetheless at the potential to uh, see condors this, this far north. Um, one other, well, two other items, uh, the agency has been contacted by the Fish and Wildlife Service in, in requesting assistance in completing a species uh, sat status assessment for gray wolves. Uh, so the game division will be providing perspective and input to that process, um, looking at uh, gray wolf listing. And then lastly, uh, I just wanted to make sure the commission was aware that um, a congressman from Tennessee about a month ago introduced some federal legislation to ban killing contests on public lands. Um, we can certainly you know, keep you apprised. Uh, it has at this point only been introduced and referred to, uh, I think, a, a livestock and ag committee in, in the House. Um, and it is pertaining only to public lands um, and has many of many similar provisions to what you all considered here in terms of promotion and uh, but it does um, expressly prohibit participation and um, it there are caveats for um, things such as invasive species contests like the removal of an invasive, pythons and the Everglades. And there's also caveats that would allow for the continuation of things like uh, big buck contests. So um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll continue to, to monitor that and um, apprise the commission should there, should there be any movement um, that you'd be interested in. So if there aren't any questions on those items, I'll, I'll commence with reading the, the fisheries division activity report. We have a, we have a question. Commissioner McNinn. Sorry, Tony. Um, you mentioned the condors. Um, I will tell you that there were, there's a, an anecdotal sighting of two condors down in Las Vegas in the Southwest portion of the city, just within the last couple of weeks. And they're hard to miss. I mean, you know, they're, they're not that hard to identify. They're massive. And um, so that, you know, bringing that up, Tony, I mean, it, it does. And the reason I think it's important to, to kind of, put a note next to it is um, the biggest threat to condors still to this day is lead poisoning. And it's going to prompt those conversations again, probably that um, I know that there are folks that go to the waffle meetings, uh, sportsmen that are pursuing, um, you know, getting rid of lead bullets. Um, and they, they demonstrate the ballistics and they show, you know, their studies, what their studies are showing. So, I think it's just planting that seed that there's going to be conversations on that eventually. I mean, um, it's taken 40 years to get these birds to where they are, and they're still less than 500, probably 500 ish. I don't know where's Jen, give or take. And the, the point is, is that they're a real important part of the ecosystem. We almost lost them. Um, they're they're coming back, and but it's going to come with some other conversations. And so I just kind of plant that seed that I, I think it's on the horizon never ends. So. Thank you, Commissioner McNich. And as you know, uh, there are already a, a number of conversations around lead and um, there are conversations occurring right now uh, regarding uh, the potential prohibition of, of lead for upland species on uh, within the refuge system um, and other, and other places. So 
Um, certainly, as those conversations continue, we'll, we'll provide updates as well. So from the fisheries division, uh, as the temperatures get warmer, fisheries division personnel wrapping up their report writing and budget budgeting responsibilities and transitioning into the 2022 field season. All summertime seasonal conservation aid employees have been hired and field work will begin in earnest um, later this month, mid, mid part of the month. A number of fisheries headquarters staff recently attended a basic grants management course that was hosted by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and that'll undoubtedly assist in the management of various fisheries programs. For the first time in over six months, fisheries headquarters and regions are most mostly fully staffed. Some hatchery vacancies still exist. Um, those have been filtering through uh, this week with offers offers being made. So hopefully we're moving towards a, a full fishery staff very shortly. Aquatic Invasive Species Program, the AIS inspection stations are near full staff for the upcoming busy boating season. AIS station at Rye Patch will not be operational in 22 due to water levels. Similarly, uh, boat ramps at Colville Bay on Lake Mead were recently closed. Heavy boat traffic and long wait times are expected at the only remaining ramps at Hemingway Harbor and Cottonwood Cove down at Lake Mojave. Fish hatcheries, busy spring stocking season is upon us. Hatchery personnel throughout the state, currently stocking catchable trout throughout most of the state and catfish stocking in urban ponds in Clark County has also been initiated. Native Aquatic Species Program, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced an emergency endangered listing for the Dixie Valley toads in early April, citing threats from a planned geothermal plant nearby. Endow staff will be assisting the Fish and Wildlife Service with a species status assessment for that species. In addition, Endow staff is currently assisting the Fish and Wildlife Service in preparation of a species status assessment for western ridged mussels, which were recently petitioned for listing, listing under the Endangered Species Act. Western ridged mussels are native to rivers um, and lakes throughout the western U.S. and can be found in northeastern Nevada. Water conditions, ongoing drought conditions persist throughout most of the state. Many lakes reservoirs are coming out of winter at unprecedented levels for this time of year. Some current reservoir capacity data includes Wild Horse Reservoir at 54%, Lahontan Reservoir at 44%, Rye Patch at 5%, and Lake Mead at 35%, which is an all-time low. A number of fish salvage projects are anticipated in the next four to five months, and some have already been initiated. Eastern region fisheries, a substantial fish kill was experienced at Wild Horse Reservoir immediately following ice off on April 5th, after the reservoir went from almost completely ice covered to ice free within a two day period. The reservoir had stratified, uh, just meaning layers of temperatures under the ice, causing a layer of water with very low oxygen content to form in the deeper water areas. The low oxygen content in the water was exacerbated by large biomass of yellow perch, so low water levels during winter, and aquatic vegetation that was decomposing and using the available dissolved oxygen. The fish kill was comprised of over 99% yellow perch. So it was almost exclusively yellow perch, which was estimated to be at over half a million fish. Uh, thankfully, uh, nearly no trout, bass, or catfish or wipers were affected. It's anticipated that a reduction of biomass in yellow perch will benefit the reservoir in the long run, reducing the biomass, especially during the current drought. Weekly monitoring by fisheries biologists have found that the fish kill has subsided. And since ice off, the fishing for trout has been very good. Approximately 1,000 wipers are planned to be stocked in mid-May to provide future biological controls to regulate yellow perch populations. In eight stocking events, excuse me, shocking events, fish shocking, not alarming, uh, five nights and three mornings, Endow staff have removed 13 northern pike from Cummins Lake. Combination of poor spring weather conditions and timing of ice off resulted in endow personnel missing the peak spawning period this year, which is why northern pike numbers are significantly less than the 2021 effort of 103 northern pike. 
So I, I guess that's to say that um, there's clearly more than 13 northern pike in there, but uh, didn't didn't hit that spawn um, ideally. Southern region fishery, southern region uh, biologists recently assisted conservation education staff and a number of displays and activities at the Clark County Fair. And our staff assisted with springtime dive counts at Devil's Hole in early April, which were significant for two reasons. This marked the 50th anniversary of conducting dive counts at Devil's Hole when they were first initiated in 1972. And secondly, the counts this spring were the highest spring counts in 22 years. The final counts expected to be 175 fish or more. Recent Virgin River fish surveys resulted in the capture of numerous flannel mouth suckers, which are native to the river. Regional staff reviewed the 30 percent design plans for restoration of large of a large portion of Sunnyside Creek on Kirch Wildlife Management Area. Sunnyside Creek is native habitat to endangered White River Spine Dace and the only remaining habitat following the loss of populations of other historic habitats due to modifications related to water delivery. The restoration effort will restore a portion of the Sunnyside Creek to its relic meandering stream channel rather than its current ditch which was diverted years ago. Western region fisheries, Winnemucca sport fish biologists will be delivering the Western region's electrofishing boat to Midwest Lakes electrofishers in Missouri for repairs. The boat has been non-functional for over a year and the repairs have long been needed in order for regional staff to monitor and augment their fisheries. Regional staff are also beginning to work with commercial collectors to capture and transport various sport fish species, white crappie, channel cats, white bass from Rye Patch Reservoir to the recently repaired Little Washoe Lake. These efforts are expected to continue for several weeks. I'm beginning to think uh, Mr. Crookshanks made this particularly lengthy knowing he wasn't gonna be here. Annual Third Creek and Incline Creek project has commenced at Incline Village. This project studies the effectiveness of lake resident trout in uh, spawning in these two tributary streams while simultaneously collecting and fertilizing eggs from these fish to be hatched and reared at our Mason Valley hatchery. Rainbow trout are currently used as a surrogate species to determine the possibility of LCT using these streams in the future. A number of very large rainbow trout have already been contacted and hand spawned. That concludes the report from the fisheries division and I could try to answer any questions if there are any, but there's no guarantees on the answer. Any questions? He got off easy. <laughs> Kimberly Munoz, Division Administrator, Data and Technology Services. The 2022 Big Game Application, Data and Technology Services Licensing and Hunt Staff are all in the final weeks of the 2022 Big Game application. So far, the application numbers have been down from last year. After five weeks, there were 125,000 applications submitted, which is about 8% decline from the same time in 21. The overall number of calls into the call center are also down 20% compared to last year. There's been an increase in the number of applications marked as alternates, as well as the average number of applications submitted per person this year. By the end of week five, there had been someone that had applied from all 49 states, or 49 states, but now we have all 50 states. Um, we have acquired 676 new customers and had 280 or 2,835 customers reactivated which means they applied in 2020, but not in 2021. These numbers are roughly half of what we did the same time last year. The cutoff for applying for tags is Tuesday, May 11th at 11 p.m. After that, we will be conducting a test draw and validating all of the data. If the data looks good, we'll be conducting the actual draw on Wednesday, May 18th, with the results being emailed to clients at 9 p.m. Friday, May 20th. 2023 heritage tag proposals. The department received proposals from 11 vendors for the 2023 heritage tags that will be presented, that were presented at the May 5th Heritage Committee. Geographic information systems. 
The Geographic Information System staff has been busy completing three posters for the Nevada GIS conference on bighorn sheep, the SCAT tool built for habitat, the remote sensing veg work, um, sensing vegetation work. And I'll just stop and say that this event just happened in the last two days and staff actually their posters won first place, third place and crowd favorite at this conference. So pretty proud of that. They completed a map um, of the new Argento Wildlife Management Area. The first draft of the SWAP species distribution map updates to the vegetation health assessment, sage grouse, lek count, and the toad survey forms, along with the updates to the raptor nest data for internal use to be shared with our federal partners. Finally, they documented the uh, external process for data requests. Information technology staff finished the new server upgrades for both Las Vegas and the headquarters location. They also have set up nine new employees, six new computers, and closed out 152 uh, help desk tickets. That concludes my director's activity report. And with that, I will take any questions the commission might have. Okay, so I just want to clarify. You said Tuesday, May 11th, but Tuesday is May 10th. You are correct. Is it, is it, because I have the 10th in my head. You are correct. <laughs> okay. Yes. So it's May 10th. Okay. Yep. Any questions for Ms. Munoz? Okay. Thanks. And I promise I'll get my apps in. <laughs> Just checking. Sounds like it's on. Uh, good day, everybody. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, members of the commission. Uh, Chief Game Warden Mike Maynard uh, with the divisional report from law enforcement. In wildlife investigations and throughout the regions, Eastern Region Wardens completed several investigations, including close shed antler gathering, resulting in a citation being issued in each case, the suspected mountain lion kill of two calves, and the unlawful tampering and destruction of a hawk's nest. Western Region Wardens continued working on a guide related investigation a mountain lion depredation event involving a mountain lion entering a chicken coop and killing chickens, a record sized fish caught in closed waters and an arrest on an animal cruelty warrant. In Southern region, warden seized four illegally possessed venomous snakes from an individual in Las Vegas, including one Moroccan puff adder for which there is no known anti-venom in the region or probably the Western United States. The reptiles were humanely euthanized. In Boating Safety Patrol, Southern Region Game Wardens rescued three individuals from Bureau of Reclamation on Lake Mojave, whose vessel was taking on water and could not make it back to the marina. In the public safety arena, Eastern Region, Region Wardens responded to assist Elko County Sheriff's Office with a shots fired barricaded subject in a uh, call in a home in Spring Creek. The suspect was taken into custody by Elko County. In other public safety responses, this included an Eastern Region Warden that assisted Elko County Fire with a tractor trailer fire, Western Region Wardens assisting Lyon County deputies with locating a UTV accident, which had three severe head trauma patients near Fernley, and Southern Region Wardens assisted National Park Service Rangers with the fatal motorcycle accident in Lake Mead. Out of headquarters, boating education staff worked at Clark County Fair, the Reno Boat Show, and participated in interdivisional readiness working group within the department. Lastly, I want to acknowledge two wardens have left uh, the employee of Endow since the last commission meeting, Game Warden Investigator Scott Giles, last based in Ely, has retired, and Game Warden John Anderson, who is based in Panaca, has accepted a position with the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office. Thank you, Scott and John, for your many years of commendable service to the state of Nevada. Department of Wildlife and the citizens of the state of Nevada. And one final note in hiring, we currently have six vacancies in the division, including one lieutenant, one investigator, and four game wardens. And with that, I will happily take any questions. Any questions for, no, Captain Maynard, Chief Maynard, sorry, just demoted you, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, thank you, and thank Mr. Or, uh, uh, Officer Giles and Anderson for their, or Warden Giles and Anderson for their service. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is that it? Yep. That concludes our uh, activity report. So thank okay. you, Madam Chair. Okay.
We'll move on to uh, agenda item 6B, Wildlife Heritage Committee Report, Heritage Committee Chairman Tom Barnes, informational. A report will be provided on the recent Heritage Committee meeting. Okay. We met last evening. Um, I think we had a really good meeting. We had some great projects presented to us. We had some really good discussion, but uh, we reviewed the 2023 Heritage Tag season quotas. And then we reviewed the, uh, the 2023 vendor proposal. And we uh, have an initial recommendation. We're gonna meet um, prior to our June commission meeting to, to finalize our recommendation. And then we will uh, present that to the commission. We, uh, we also reviewed the, the heritage account funds that we have available to us for uh, fiscal year 2023, which was uh, just a little over 1.5 million. Um, the projects presented to us, um, we had available, we would have funded all projects. It was 1.6 million. So we, uh, we do are gonna have to do a little bit of, uh, of trimming. And, and again, we made an initial uh, proposal and prior to the June commission meeting, we will meet again to, uh, to finalize our recommendations, which we'll bring to the, uh, the full commission at that point in time. But uh, there were really a bunch of really good projects and does any uh, any of the the members have anything they want to want to add? So that, that's that's our that's our report for now. We'll we'll have have more to bring to you um, in June. Okay, thanks. No questions, additions. Nope. Okay, great. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Uh, agenda item six C: Litigation Report. Senior Deputy Attorney General K Craig Burkett informational a report will be provided on the nevada department of wildlife litigation thank you chairwoman east uh, as usual this will be short and sweet if anything related to litigation can be sweet <laughs> uh, essentially the water law cases that the department's handling or uh, that the attorney general's office are handling for the department are dormant as you may recall two months ago we uh, had a trial that um, was concluded with the defense verdict. One remaining issue uh, has been uh, submitted on motion work related to claims that the department did properly respond to Public Records Act requests, um, which of course we denied. We're, that issue is now submitted before Judge Walker and we're waiting a decision on that before uh, the department uh, and on behalf of the department and the individuals who defended the case, we will file motions for attorney's fees. Um, and I, I suspect uh, that there will be an appeal um, from the plaintiff's side on that case. Um, and that's essentially it for litigation issues. If you have any questions, I stand ready and willing to respond. Any questions for Dag Burkett? Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, 7C, appeal. Mr. James Collard, subguide denial, Senior Deputy Attorney General Craig Burkett for possible action. This item is a continuation of the prior March hearing regarding this appeal. The commission will consider adopting and issuing oral findings of fact and conclusion of law based on the evidence heard and considered at the March 2022 hearing. Good morning, Good morning, Madam Chair and uh, Commission. Uh, for the record, Deputy Attorney General Todd Weiss. Uh, prior to the prior, to Madam Chair conducting this agenda item, I just want to remind members of the Commission that this is strictly a non-vote, non-discussion agenda item. This is a procedural measure only, in which the Chairwoman will read the document um, that is in front of her that you've also been provided copies of into the record before signing it. The document in question is an approved findings of fact and conclusions of law. Uh, from the Russell Collard appeal hearing that took place uh, at the commission meeting back on March 25th, 2022 in Clark County. Uh, it is, as you know, is a brief summary of the hearing, the deliberations and the decision of the commission back on March 25th. The verbal reading of the document here completes the record. Uh, that being said, the hearing on Russell Collard's appeal and the decision of this commission back on March 25th, 2022 is closed and final. This is not an opportunity for further discussion or deliberation on the matter, and it is very important that the chairwoman be allowed to read the findings of fact and conclusions of law into the record without any additional commentary by the commission. 
And with that, thank you and please proceed, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Okay, so before the Board of Wildlife Commission, State of Nevada, appeal of Russell Collard, there is no case number, date of hearing, March 25, 2022, findings of fact, conclusions of law and decision. This, this agency proceeding here and after matter came on for hearing before the Board of Wildlife Commission on March 25, 2022 in Clark County, Nevada. Members present were Chairwoman e Tiffany East, Alana Weiss, Casey Keel, David McNinch, John Allenberg, Ron Perini, Shane Rogers, and Tommy Cabilia. Commissioner Tom Barnes was absent and did not participate. Providing legal counsel for the commission was Todd Weiss, Deputy Attorney General. The Department of Wildlife was presented, represented by counsel Craig Burkett, Deputy Attorney General. At the time of the hearing, appellant Russell Collard was present and also represented by counsel Benjamin Cloward, Esquire. The matter concerns an appeal by Mr. Collard, appellant of the Department of Wildlife's decision to suspend his subguide license for a period of three years, subject to a conviction of a wildlife crime on November 9, 2021. With this matter having been submitted to the commission with evidence and testimony from all sides presented and heard, the commission now enters the following findings of fact, conclusions of law and decision. Findings of fact, this agency proceeding matter came for hearing before the commission on March 25, 2022 in Clark County, Nevada, concerning appellant's appeal of the Department of Wildlife suspension of his subguide license for three years. Both counsel addressed the commission and argued their respective positions concerning the license suspension appeal. After argument, presentation of evidence and testimony of several witnesses, the adjudicating members of the commission made the following findings of fact. One, appellant was at the time of the events in question an experienced licensed subguide. Appellant admitted to placing, I'm sorry, two. Appellant admitted to placing one trial camera trail camera play him on public property and leaving it in place past the lawful date under the mistaken belief that it was in fact on private property. Number three, appellant admitted to utilizing both the trail camera as well as an elaborate baiting scheme for this express purpose of assisting a client in hunting. Conclusions of law, four, a subguide license is a privilege and not a right. Five, subguides such as appellant are relied on by their clients, hunters, and others in the public to know, follow, and uphold the hunting laws at all times in their activities and are therefore held to a higher standard of conduct. Six, a licensed subguide of appellant's experience was or should have been familiar with all Nevada wildlife laws and regulations bearing on that license, including knowledge that baiting of big game animals is unlawful on private and pub public property in the state of Nevada. Seven, ignorance of the law is not a valid excuse for unlawful conduct of a licensed subguide, especially one as experienced as appellant. Eight, appellant placed one trail camera on public property and left in place after August 1st in violation of NAC 503.1485. Nine, appellant intentionally placed bait or knowingly utilized a baiting scheme for the purpose of hunting in violation of NAC 503.149. Motion and decision. At the conclusion of the hearing, Chairwoman East made a motion that Appellant Russell Collard's subguide license be suspended for three years due to his having placed a trail camera on public land beyond the allowable date and illegally baiting wildlife for the purpose of hunting in violation of NAC 503.1485 and NAC 503.149, respectively. That motion was voted on and approved unanimously by the adjudicating members of the commission, eight to zero with Commissioner Barnes absent. It is hereby ordered by an eight to zero decision of the commission as follows. One, the decision of the Department of Wildlife is upheld and appellant Russell Collard's subguide license will be suspended for a period of three years beginning on the date of his criminal conviction on November 9, 2021. The appellant may reapply for his license no sooner than November 9, 2024. Dated this sixth day of May, 2022, signed by Chairwoman Board of Wildlife Commissioners. Mr. Weiss, do I give this to you? Okay, thank you. Okay, so that concludes uh, number seven, our appeal. And uh, will the record please reflect that Commissioner McNinch is departing our meeting for a short time. 
Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to agenda item number 10. And 10. Nevada Department of Wildlife Project updates Secretary Wasley informational. The commission has requested that the department provide regular project updates for ongoing projects and programs as appropriate based on geography and timing of meetings. These updates are intended to provide additional detail in addition to the summaries provided as part of the regular department activity report and are intended to educate the commission and public as to the department's ongoing duties and responsibilities. <coughs> Good morning again. Good morning. On. Yes. Jennifer Newmark, Wildlife Diversity Division Administrator. Do we have our PowerPoint? Ah, there it is. Great. So this morning, I'm going to talk to you all about our Nevada Ac Wildlife Action Plan and the revision that it's currently undergoing. And then also we'll touch a little bit on the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. So our state uh, wildlife action plans are federally mandated state conservation plans. All 50 states and territories are required to have them. And it allows us to be eligible for federal funding um, called state wildlife grants. And then when Recovering America's Wildlife Act gets passed, it will allow us to be eligible for that funding. They're required to be revised every 10 years and ours will expire in this coming um, September. The plans uh, prioritize key species and habitats. It sets conservation goals and management actions and we view it as a comprehensive conservation plan for the state. Um, just briefly, the um, the Fish and Wildlife Service oversees the, um, the approval of these plans and they leave it up to the states to make the plans be whatever we need for conservation in our state. But they do have eight required elements that each plan must have. And that includes um, designating species of greatest conservation need, which is the SGCN bubble. And sorry for the acronym there, but limited space on a screen. So say uh, species of greatest conservation need, we need to address key habitats, the threats that are um, impacting those species and habitats. We must have conservation actions. We must include monitoring. We have to coordinate with partners. And then the review piece is that every 10 year requirement. Um, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies has also provided guidance to the states on ways that we can help our state wildlife action plans um, coordinate across our boundaries. Um, this is voluntary guidance to help meet those eight required elements. It provides us standards to increase that consistency. Um, we share lessons that we learned um, with each other, and then uh, we highlight innovation and tools. Um, Nevada is a little bit ahead of many of the states, so um, we are still using the November 2012, but they're working on a new revised best practices for upcoming other state revisions. Um, so as you have um, seen before, um, our plan was last uh, approved in 2012. It's our comprehensive plan to protect and manage our species. Um, the way that we designated the species of greatest conservation need in the current plan is we include federal and state endangered threatened sensitive designated species. Those um, species that have declining trends or restricted ranges, if there's serious habitat concerns, or if we have a high level of the global conservation responsibility for the species, and then also just management priorities for the state. And so not all species of greatest conservation need are necessarily in conservation trouble. Uh, primary goal of our plan is to keep common species common as well. We currently have 256 species of greatest conservation need, and it does cover all the different um, taxa within the state, and it covers all different designated species. So it includes mule deer and Lahontan cutthroat trout, waterfowl, small mammals, um, passer and birds, reptiles, et cetera. We also designate 22 key habitat types, and these are of course tied to our species of conservation need. 
So that's the current plan. Now we're moving into our new revision. And, um, and I just want to acknowledge that this, while I am presenting on it, this is not a wildlife diversity product. And it's also not just a Nevada Department of Wildlife product. We have um, a large number of people that are designating a whole lot of time to helping us with this, including all um, the key staff from every division. And um, at Endow, we have Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service from both fields offices and our regional office. We have the Division of Natural Heritage, um, the United States Geological Survey, Tribal Representatives, Nature Conservancy, and this is all being facilitated by a really awesome group um, from Kearns and West that are keeping us honest and on pace. So I just want to acknowledge that because they're really working hard. And um, of course, our purpose is to provide the strategic guidance on our plan components and to meet, um, we meet bi-weekly and sometimes even more often now that we're kind of getting towards the end of it. Super busy slide because it's a super busy plan. And um, just to show that we have been incrementally working on this since January of 2021, where we kicked off the original revision. And uh, um, of course, our first steps were to um, evaluate what's the use of our current plan like, and what do people find useful in it? So we did a public survey um, and uh, that was really helpful. Then we've moved on to evaluating our species and habitat mapping and then um, compiling our data, making sure we have everything organized. And then we um, sent out a partner and public survey. We finalized our species list and now we're moving on to threats and goals and actions. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these pieces, but just so you can see the overall timeline and then the target date of September 6th of 2022. And then one other component that I wanna mention here, and this is new for this revision, is we are working on a regional chapter. And so we're coordinating formally with the state of Arizona, who has a very similar timeline to our swap revision, but we're also working with um, our counterparts in New Mexico and California and Utah. And again, more consistently looking at how can we be collaborating across our state boundaries on species of um, need that we both share. Okay, so that results, um, the kickoff survey results was just, um, the top uses of our current plan is that it's used for planning and NEPA purposes. It's a species and habitat information. Um, lots of people use that plan because we have species accounts and it documents all of the um, needs of the species. And then they use it for conservation strategies and management issues. We asked, what would you like to see new in the plan? And hands down, the most significant one was to make it a little bit more user-friendly. Um, it's a huge document. And uh, so with this time around, we're looking at making it web-enabled, um, a little bit more searchable. And then, of course, we're adding in those regional considerations. We've gone through extensive species evaluations from the fisheries game and wildlife diversity divisions that included assessments on threats, population trends, population fragmentation and loss of habitat, endemism, um, status of the species with various agencies, and again, that global responsibility. And then for a lot of the more obscure species in the state, that data needs and information gap is a real driver for us, especially in diversity division. So here's where we landed. Um, in 2012, we had 256 species. Uh, we are currently have 302 on our on our SGCN list. You can see um, where we've added species and removed species. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those considerations and, and what the jumps in those numbers was due to. So one, um, you know, Biologists are constantly looking at the genetics and especially as genetic tools get more and more sophisticated. And so there are, we often see a lot of taxonomic changes. And so some of the changes on our list are due to a species that had been evaluated and then were split into two species. Some had two subspecies that were combined into a full species. And then for a couple of, a handful of species on there, um, we had made the management decision that the subspecies 
specific level of um, species was a more appropriate thing to manage. And that would be like pocket gophers that are widely distributed around the state, but we have a couple of valleys that have, um, you know, some significant needs there. And so we would manage at the subspecific level and not the full population. Um, there is also new assessments that have been done in the intervening 10 years that have either shown declines or improving conditions. And so in total, we have looked at over 600 species and assessed them for inclusion in our action plan. On the habitat side, um, there's also been significant revision. So um, you've heard uh, Division Administrator Janae speak about this habitat the Endow Strategic Habitat Framework. And so we wanted to make sure that the State Wildlife Action Plan aligns with that. So we changed our classification system for the habitats to land fire, which allows us to look at state and transition modeling. So you can compare how habitats were um, like 10 years ago to how we project them in the future. And we can start looking at like what are ideal considerations and, and how are they deviating from that. Um, so the 22 key habitats in the 2012 plan are now um, being reclassified into 17 major habitats. And then, like I mentioned, this allows us for making estimates of departure and it helps us kind of hone in on where the areas we need to really focus on. Um, in January, we sent out a really large public and partner survey. It went to over 280 formal partners, and then over 100,000 individuals that were all from our Endow listservs. Um, we had a little over 1,500 total responses, and you can see the breakdown here, but over 75% of the respondents were from interested citizens, which is really awesome. And um, one of those required elements is to include public participation, so it's really nice to have some engagement here. We had respondents from every single county in the state. Um, of course, Washoe and Clark had the highest numbers. And we asked about our proposed species of greatest conservation need. And we asked them if we were doing a good job at representing the actual needs in the state. And by and large, we got good response for that. Um, some feedback that we um, received was there's concern about large mammals and game species. There was mention of migratory birds and hummingbirds and shorebirds, and we had some feedback on like don't include those peripheral species that just kind of touch on Nevada, really focus on those species that we have that larger global responsibility for. Um, some people expressed a lack of concern about bats and mollusks, which hurt my heart a little bit, but that's okay. And then, um, and then there were some questions about why more species weren't removed from the list. Um, we asked those same questions about our habitat. And again, really strong, positive response um, that we were doing a good job representing the habitats that had high conservation importance. And then um, really just some of the key themes coming out of that was the importance of wetland and riparian and even more so now that we're in our mega drought. Um, there was a little bit of concern about grouping some habitat types and this is kind of technical, but we'll be splitting some of that out and addressing it in the plan. And then um, you know, demonstrating those departures from ideal conditions was um, also mentioned. A couple of new elements for the state wildlife action plan that weren't in previous versions is this time around, we are gonna include a chapter on terrestrial invertebrates. And while Endow does not have statutory authority over um, invertebrates in the state, we recognize that this is meant to be a more comprehensive conservation plan that looks ecosystem wide. And, uh, um, and while, we won't be doing implementation work on terrestrial invertebrates ourselves. We certainly can help partners and work together across jurisdictions to include that. We also, as I mentioned, will have that regional landscape conservation chapter um, that will be formally collaborating with Arizona. It will actually be like a, a probably the exact same chapter in both state plans. And then we're working with Utah, California and New Mexico on their plans. Theirs are due in 2025. So we'll have a little bit of opportunity to um, create some synergy there as well. 
Um, what we're currently working on is we had staff go through and do a really deep dive in all the threats assessments. Um, we've been working on climate change. We're developing goals and actions for our species and habitats. And then one kind of cool, well, it's not kind of, it is cool um, piece of our plan this year as part of that regional work with Arizona. We're working on developing predictive species distribution models across the two states. So we have 52 species that are in common between Arizona and Nevada. And so those are going to be um, going through some modeling and that will hopefully help us up, help us set up some good conservation goals. So we can't talk about state wildlife action plans without uh, tying it to Recovering America's Wildlife Act. And Tony already stole a lot of my thunder, but um, just to let you know where these acts are right now, um, and a reminder that this would provide 1.4 billion in annual dedicated funding to implement our state wildlife action plans. Um, there's a lot of bipartisan support. Um, these are collaborative, proactive, um, non-regulatory plans that really is recognized as the way to achieve good conservation um, across the country. And then always, um, you know, that leverages those federal dollars with our state dollars. So we get three federal dollars to every one um, dollar that the state puts in. Um, it's tied to conservation and management of our SGCN species and habitats, but there's also um, uh, funding in the Act for Conservation Education and Outdoor Recreation. New to this one um, is they have um, availability for funding to manage and control invasive species and address diseases, which is a key component here in Nevada. Um, we can uh, use recovering funds to help with law enforcement activities and then also to recover listed endangered and threatened species. Um, our, the House bill is 2773. Um, we have 173 current co-sponsors on it, bipartisan again. In January of 2022, it passed out of the Water, Oceans, and Wildlife Subcommittee on a bipartisan uh, vote of 29 to 15. It currently does not identify the funding source and three of our, um, of our four Nevada representatives are co-sponsors on the House bill. On the Senate side, it's Senate Bill 2372. And um, we have 34 bipartisan co-sponsors because I hadn't updated it since yesterday when Senator Cortez Masto was able to sign on and one other Senator. Um, so it'll be, it has 16 Republicans and 17 Democrats and one independent. Um, in April of 2022, it passed out of the Senate committee on a bipartisan vote of 15 to five. And it does um, identify the source of funding, which is a, an important piece. So it's unappropriated fees that have been collected from violations of other environmental regulations. Um, both of our senators are co-sponsors on it. And as Director Wasley already mentioned, um, the next steps for these um, will be floor votes, reconciliation between the two, and then signing into law. And that is all I have for you. Thank you for your patience. That was a long update, but any questions? Very interesting. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Newmark? No? Right, I don't thanks. think I have any either. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we'll go on to agenda item number nine, which is the final fiscal year 2023 predation management plan. Wildlife staff specialist Pat Jackson for possible action. The commission will review the final draft of the fiscal year 2023 draft predation management plan with the department. The commission may take action to modify or endorse the plan. Good morning. Um, good morning. Pat Jackson, staff specialist for the record. I would like to echo uh, Chairwoman East's uh, gratitude that we're all in person. It's nice. It was a little difficult <laughs> to not wear sweatpants with my top, but uh, <laughs> I was able, able to find these and uh, they still fit. So all is well. <laughs> um, so I have a short presentation that just highlights the overall predator plan and the changes in projects. And then I have a longer one that goes over each project and I would leave it to you, Chairwoman, on which one you'd like to see. Uh, why don't we go through the longer version? Okay. We have the time. 
It's important. Am I gonna regret that decision? <laughs> uh, Should I don't we think take so. a quick break? <laughs> it's not that long. Uh, <laughs> okay. But, and, but that's your call. You no, we'll go. It. Go ahead. So I'll be presenting the final uh, final PowerPoint presentation for the fiscal year 2023 predator management plan. Uh, there's quite a few moving parts to the predator uh, program, so I'll go over those quickly. In November, I, point, I reported out on fiscal year 2021. We're currently in fiscal year 2022. That goes July 1 to June 30 of the following year. And I'm providing the predator plan for fiscal year 2023. And all various plans and reports can be on our website, or you can reach out to me and I can send them directly. Uh, by NRS, the $3 fee is generated every time sportsmen apply for a big game or a turkey tag. That's most recently generated about $858,000 a year. Of that, $14,000 goes to the Nevada Department of Agriculture for administrative support. The remainder goes towards predator projects outlined in this plan and then is also available for staff salary. And if we uh, have a shortcoming, don't spend it all. It does remain in the account. It does not revert to a general fund. Uh, a little bit more about how we can spend those funds based on NRS, the management of predatory wildlife, uh, research tools and techniques on predatory wildlife, and then the protection of sensitive species. And then we are mandated to spend 80% of those revenues on, uh, on lethal removal and an aspect of that lethal removal can be monitoring. So a budget summary, we generated just over 858,000 in fiscal year 2021. To reach that 80% mandate, we need to be at 686,000. And in this current plan, I have uh, 759,000 allocated uh, towards lethal removal. Uh, this is the short version. It's the other one. So the, this morning I, I had a call at 6.15 with some collaborators and decided to update a couple slides. So that uh, antiquated the PowerPoint presentation I gave to Missy yesterday and I sent her to this morning and I think we're waiting on the building's Wi-Fi. Should I walk it up there? Mr. Chair? Yes. If I could, if I, I'd like to ask Pat a question. I think it's been a couple of years now that I've, I've listened to a lot of these things. And I think what I wanted to hear from you, or maybe better information to give it to me, is the fact is that sometimes when you have so much money, which is good, and you're doing some really good things to make everything better. But when you have that kind of money, then you obviously have to give that to departments or companies or whatever it is to go and do that correctly the way you want it done. Um, you have a lot of information from that comes from the department too, and being able to see what they can do to protect all the different animals or whatever it might be. I'm just asking a simple question. Do you have a list of people or organizations or whatever it is that would use this, that kind of money that was given from this agency to give to them to go and take all those projects? Does that make sense to you? I mean, how do you come up with all the money, all the people to do all the things that you want to have done? Uh, that's a great question, especially in this uh, lull of loading uh, PowerPoint <laughs> presentation. So uh, I, I think that was two questions. One, is there a place that we could go to see who we work with, that we spend the money? And then two, how do we find those people? Uh, it depends on the topic. So for uh, uh, management of predatory wildlife first and foremost we work with usda wildlife services a federal entity uh here in nevada we, we, you've probably met mark ono the new state uh, director for wildlife services 
they, wildlife services, cannot uh, conduct management of predators in wilderness or wilderness study areas unless we, uh, unless it's for health and human safety. So that predominantly falls with with mountain lions. And so we have a contract with an entity to uh, to use hounds into uh, uh, also uh, foot snare lions, and that's both for for lethal removal as well as uh, research. And then for our research topics. Um, it, it really depends on how we meet people. We work with the USGS, uh, Pete Coates, he's a known entity uh, for our uh, black bear integrated population model on the Western front. Uh, we did what's known as a sub grant announcement where we put an announcement saying we want that model built on our website and advertise that far and wide and had people apply. And, uh, and it, it, so it just, it just depends. But as far as who we work with, uh, every November when I come to the commission meeting and report out on the predator report, uh, I generally emphasize who we work with. And then at times they come and speak, but then it's also captured in that written document and any contractors that we have also uh, in following the guidance of policy 23 also provide a, uh, 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 contractor report that is in the appendix of the predator report. Why don't we take a little bit of a break since we have a lull? Missy, are you still working? Okay, why don't we take a 10 minute break? We'll be back at 1050. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Do you know what? I'm sorry? Do you know what? Do I know what? Do you know where I what? I got it. <laughs> well, eat one. I shouldn't they're do it. They're there for sugar. you. And there's fritters there, too. Okay. There are many ones. No, I'm not. Oh, yeah. I don't, I shouldn't either, but. Well, you know. I, I don't know that anybody should. You know my kidneys now? Oh, yeah. There's like four whenever you're ready. That's not. Let's wait. So I went to a doctor on it. They're saying, well, yeah.
we recommend continuing for fiscal year 2023. Um, and so this one, uh, the protection of greater sage grouse by uh, lethal raven removal. Uh, and so this is a collaboration with USDA Wildlife Services uh, where, and, and also the, I should say the USGS um, uh, helping us decide where to conduct, uh, conduct removals. Uh, this is again, Wildlife Services performing the work. Uh, we're doing surveys pre-treatment pre and then using corbicide known as DRC 1339, uh, uh, very species specific to ravens to create temporary voids around common, I'm sorry, uh, greater sage grouse selects and uh, nesting areas. And so this has a fairly large budget. We're optimistic the Fish and Wildlife Service is going to increase our depredation permit. Uh, and so uh, this year we will not spend that since we're still uh, uh, limited to our 2,500, but uh, fiscal year 2023, we're optimistic to see that increase. Uh, Project 2201, mountain lion removal for protection of California bighorn sheep. Uh, this is in uh, uh, Northwest Nevada has a budget of $100,000 and is a collaboration with both wildlife services and, uh, and, and private contractors. Uh, we have a goal to see a self-sustaining uh, California sheep population in 011 and also in 013. And these are the uh, metrics set forth by the commission several predator plan renditions ago. And so we are still proactively removing lions in those areas to, to give those sheep a legs up. Uh, 22074. Uh, very similar to 2201, except this is in Hunt Unit 074. It's for Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep. Uh, this has a tune of $20,000 with the goal of maintaining a, a small but sustainable uh, sheep population. Uh, we're monitoring those sheep with us uh, in GPS collars and have now transitioned to the place where we think there are 35 to 40 individuals in that population. And so we're watching for mountain lion mortality posts to remove mountain lions if and when a bad offender shows up. Project 37, this is big game protection through mountain lions. This is a statewide uh, 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 project allowing us, the department, uh, to pivot quickly and remove lions if they cause a problem. This is a table uh, also created several renditions ago in the predator plan, looking at uh, population metrics of our various uh, uh, other big game in the state. This is not an indication that we will go in and will remove predators, but it's more of a starting in the conversation of, hey, this is some of the metrics we see in your populations and working with biologists uh, saying, okay, hey, do you think that uh, predation might be a limiting factor? Uh, so this project, uh, $100,000 for fiscal year 2023, and we work with both wildlife services and uh, private contractors. Uh, very similar to project 3738, big game protection, uh, removal of coyotes statewide, also a budget of $100,000. Uh, this is predominantly used to remove coyotes in and around uh, critical fawning habitat for pronghorn to increase uh, pronghorn fawn survival. And we really work with just wildlife services uh, for this particular project. Uh, project 40, uh, coyote and mountain lion removal to complement multifaceted management in Eureka County. Um, this is work with wildlife services. Uh, we have uh, increased the recommended budget for this year. We have a new uh, a local game biologist, uh, Sam Fino, who has a background in predator prey dynamics. And so we're going to increase our monitoring component to make uh, deeper inferences on what we think this management uh, action or actions are or are not doing. Um, and so again, then that's really uh, work with wildlife services. Uh, Project 41, Common Raven Management and Experimentation. This is a collaboration with USGS, uh, Pete Coates. We've had several presentations with some of the findings from this. Uh, one of the upcoming commission meetings, I will come and have them elaborate on the use of the SMART tool that they've developed, which is a series of GIS layers and several other aspects of data that help us understand shifting raven densities and target our removal uh, as surgically as possible. It's a, it's a, it's a really cool tool and I'm, I'm really proud of it. So we will follow up with that. Um, the budget this year, uh, we, we may see a cap in the game division uh, for uh, Pittman Robertson funding. Typically, this is funded 25% with $3 fee, 75% Pittman Robertson. This year, we may, I intentionally use the word may, fund this uh, exclusively with $3 fee. Uh, Project 42, uh, assisting mountain lion habitat and, I'm sorry, mountain lion harvest in Nevada. Uh, this is really a mountain lion integrated population model. I reported in November on their, uh, their findings. I'm working with them now to uh, 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 refine the model 
uh, develop an R Shiny tool, which is a desktop uh, download that anybody could plug and play with. And then we're also uh, have an outline of a manuscript and expect to have this finished. So we'll be reporting out on a, a greater understanding of what's going on uh, with our mountain lions and its population estimate in the state. Uh, Project 43, uh, MISO predator removal to protect waterfowl, turkeys and pheasants on wildlife management areas, a budget of $50,000. We work with USDA Wildlife Services, predominantly on Overton and Mason Valley, the removal of MISO predators to predominantly uh, increase uh, waterfowl uh, nest success and clutch size. Um, project 44, lethal removal and monitoring of mountain lions in area 24. Uh, this is a $100,000 a year project. It's turned into a collaboration with the USU and uh, US Geological Survey. Uh, we are GPS marking lions. Uh, it's a one strike you're out policy. If a lion eats a sheep, it is removed. If they don't, we continue visiting their kill sites and uh, we've come to discover quite a few interesting things. Not the least of which is the overall sample population's diet is about one third for a horse. We've reported out on this and we'll continue to uh, report out in the future. Uh, Project 45, a uh, passive survey estimate of black bears in the state. Uh, we uh, heard these findings a few uh, meetings ago and have continued or recommended to downsize, but continue this project to continue the uh, camera grid to uh, 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 refine our models and uh, monitor and estimate our, our state's black bear population. And it's a collaboration with Oxford and University of Montana. Uh, we have a postdoc that's based out of, he's technically, uh, and that's a typo, it should say, uh, University of Montana. He moved uh, from Michigan, but now uh, is here with a few technicians and is working on this project as well as the next project, Project 46, uh, which are uh, now sort of uh, one and the same, which I'll elaborate on. So investigating potential limiting factors impacting mule deer in Northwest Nevada, um, a tune of 160,000, only 25 coming from our $3 predator fee. Uh, and this is occurring in Northwest Nevada. And so the goals of this are to accurately estimate lion, horse, deer, pronghorn, and uh, likely several other species densities across the landscape. And then also uh, we're deploying weather stations uh, to look at microclimate. And uh, this is a, the same collaborators, uh, Oxford and University of Montana, Montana, and it is uh, year round. And we are slated uh, uh, to deploy GPS transmitters on lions on the Sheldon associated with this project uh, in fiscal year 2023. They, the Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge ha, is, is, is really collaborative and really excited about this. So uh, that's something that we're really excited about. Um, this is what the two camera grids look like. So blue is Project 46 in Northwest Nevada. Green is the monitoring of bears for Project 45. And you can see how they really largely come together. Um, a, a, a small aspect of this project is when we are catching deer for the deployment of GPS transmitters, we're taking uh, uh, dental imprints of their teeth. And um, this is one thing that I, the 615 this morning call I had were with the collaborators and you have folks over in England, you have to meet at weird times, but um, we all know that you're supposed to embed uh, videos in your, uh, in your PowerPoint presentations, but that's is what this looks like. So we, uh, catch a deer with a helicopter, have it flown to us, and then after it receives its GPS transmitter, we're taking that dentition. Uh, it did take a little over a minute, and then that's what it looks like. Uh, I don't have any uh, uh, preliminary findings from this. They haven't dove into the data, but I want you to know that this tooth wear is really fascinating because I, I can't even speak to what it might, if a system might be able to tell us, but uh, the rate at which deer's teeth wear out very well could play into when they reach senescence or age out and basically die of old age. Some other interesting aspects of this project, uh, they deployed 30 or so weather stations. Uh, they have, have just got back most of the data from that. This is what one looks like on the landscape and uh, things went well. It accurately caught precipitation as well as uh, temperature. And so this is just two examples of uh, high elevation versus low elevation. We all know that uh, Northwest Nevada's uh, uh, really taking uh, the drought on the chin. And so we're really interested in the microclimate, uh, particularly precipitation and how that might play into uh, wildlife densities. And with that, I'll entertain any questions. Okay, thank you. Questions for Mr. Jackson? 
None? Okay, this is an action item, so we'll take it out for public comment. We'll hear CAB comment first here in Washoe County. Okay, how about public comment here in Washoe County? And do we have anybody on Zoom, Missy? No questions on Zoom. Okay, so we'll come back. Any thoughts or comments? We need a motion to approve this. Commissioner or Vice Chair Cavillia. All right, I'm gonna, I'll make a motion to approve the final fiscal year 2023 predator management plan as presented. Okay, second. Then. Okay, I have a motion um, and a second to approve the 2023 predator plan. All in favor, please raise or say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries seven to zero with commissioners McNinch and Wise absent. Thank you. Okay, we are going to take a break uh, until 1230. And we'll come back at 1230 and go through the APRP um, policies. All right. Thanks.
the Administrative Procedures Regulation and Policy APRP Committee Report, Committee Chairman David McNinch. A report will be provided on the recent APRP Committee meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for accommodating my schedule today. I appreciate that. It, um, so the meeting, uh, our, our committee did meet uh, last week and um, we, uh, I won't get into too many details. Let's suffice it to say that we're, we're coming down the home stretch. Kaylee, I'm sorry. Um, I'm gonna let Kaylee kind of go over those things. I did wanna, I did wanna um, mention that there's a, a, you know, I hate, I hate to, go too far onto rumors and stuff, but I just wanted to explain real quick uh, what the what the committee's been working on. I think that there's a there's been some concern that I've that, that's kind of circulated back to me that um, that there's something uh, nefarious and something odd at, at hand uh, with us reviewing these policies and stuff. And uh, I think some of it's centered at frustrations with me directly, but um, I want to just clarify for the record that what we're doing is a three-year review of our policies, which is required by NRS, Nevada Supervised Statutes. And um, some of these policies, while, while largely the policies have been reviewed over time, uh, some of the policies don't reflect that they've been reviewed. And in coordination with Madam Chair, we've, uh, we've decided that we're gonna make a concerted effort to review, go over and review each and every one of them, get them updated and, um, and uh, uh, modify the review dates and review times and affirm that we've looked at them, even if we haven't done much work on them and, uh, and, you know, kind of reset for the next go around in the, the next few years. So that's all that's going on. Um, it's been a big push. I know that, that they take up a, a you know, a sizable portion of our agenda, but um, we're headed downhill and um, Kaylee, I'll let you go ahead and get us started if you would, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. That was a quick, quick report. Kaylee, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, thank you, uh, Commissioner McNinch. I well, hang on one second, Ms. Musso. And I want to just respond to Commissioner McNinch because um, I was the one who said we need to start review reviewing these policies and we got through regulation simplification and then we started on the policies. So if there's anyone to blame, it's me. Oh. <laughs> and I will take that blame, but I think it's been a really good process and we are on the home stretch and it's important work. And so there you go. Yeah. So Kaylee, if you could just give us a real quick update of our last meeting and then we'll move on. We'll, we'll move on to our next agenda item when Madam Chair is ready. Thank you. Um, and I will just add, it's not just this commission that has to review those every three years. It's every rulemaking body. So um, it's not something we could get out of or choose to do or not to do. Um, anyways, aside from that, our committee meeting, as Commissioner McNinch said, we are on the home stretch. We only have three policies, I think, to bring back to our next committee meeting. Um, and then, so that means the commission will see a number of policies uh, come to you guys for the next couple of meetings, um, except for June, because I will not be at the June commission meeting. But um, I do believe we'll be finished, hopefully, if everything goes as planned with our policy review in September. Hey. Perfect, thank you. Any questions on the committee report? Okay, so we'll move on to 8A, which is commission policy number three, appeals. First reading APRP committee chairman, David McNinch for possible action. The committee will have a first reading of commission policy three, appeals, and may make any necessary changes and may decide to move it to a second reading. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna turn it over to, to Kaylee, let her, let her get us going. Thank you, uh, Commissioner McNinch and Chairwoman East, Kaylee Musso for the record. Policy three is our appeals policy and this policy was revised by the Administrative Procedures, Regulations and Policy Committee in order to better serve the public by making the appeals process more clear. I do wanna just point to paragraph number one under procedure. Um, that was really the only thing we added to this policy and it just states upon the receipt of an appeal, the department will inform the appellant of the commission's authorities for providing relief to include the commission's lack of authority to overturn any pleadings or convictions from the co court of competent jurisdiction. And this policy is just up for a first reading as are most of these policies. So there won't be no action on these today other than moving them to a second reading. And we are available for any questions. 
Okay, any questions on policy three? Commissioner Keel. Yeah, maybe I just have a suggested edit, which would be under or within the third paragraph below procedure. Since commissioners will not engage in discussion with the appellant or about the appeal with anyone, comma, and then if we could add the word including department personnel or other personnel, just so that reads better. Okay, any other suggestions, questions? Okay, um, this is an action item, so we'll take it out for public comment. Do we have public comment on commission policy three? I don't see any, how about on Zoom? No, okay, we'll bring it back for a motion to forward to the commission, anybody? Vice Chair Cavillia? Maybe, um, I'll make a policy, I'll, <clears throat> or I'll make a motion to forward policy number three with the noted change uh, to a future commission meeting. Do I have a second? I have a second from Commissioner Keel. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Wise absent. Okay, 8B is commission policy four, petition process and adoption of regulations, first reading APRP committee chairman David, David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a first reading of commission policy four, the petition process and adoption of regulations and may make any necessary changes and may decide to move it to a second reading. Thank you, Chairwoman East. Kaylee Musso again for the record. Policy four is our petition process and adoption of regulations policy. This policy was updated by the department and the APRP committee to make the process more clear, um, to update any contact information. And then at our last committee meeting, Chairwoman East requested the term um, bags be changed to quotas. So you'll see that reflected throughout the document as well. And then I just wanted to point out one thing and that's a number one under procedure. The zip code for the department is 89511 and it looks like some of those numbers are crossed out but um, it was just a formatting type thing. So um, that is all I have on this policy. Okay, any questions on policy four? Okay, I don't see any. Any public comment on commission policy number four? Okay, anything on Zoom? Okay, we'll bring it back for a motion to approve or forward. I guess it would be forward. Yep. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll make a motion that we move um, uh, policy uh, P4, policy number four to the uh, commission for a second reading. Okay, we have a motion to approve and I have a second by Commissioner Perini to forward commission policy four to uh, the commission for a second reading. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Weiss absent. All right, 8C is commission policy 21, game and fur bearer management plans, first reading, APRP committee, Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a first reading on commission policy 21, game and fur bearer management and may make any necessary changes and may decide to move it to a second reading. Oops. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairwoman East, mm -hmm. Kaylee Musso for the record. Policy 21 is our game and fur bearer management plan. Um, we did update this policy to make a few clar er, clarifying changes uh, the main change is that in on page two, the uh, last paragraph, we added that management plans will be reviewed on a 10-year schedule rather than regularly reviewed so that we could put a time frame on it. Um, I do know that one of the cabs at least wanted to add the terms or as needed um, behind that. Um, but other than that, I am available for questions. Okay, any questions? Commissioner Barnes. Not a not a question, just a comment. I did uh, get some communication on this that uh, 
was thinking that maybe regularly or as needed would be better than uh, than putting an actual time frame on it. I mean, regularly in ten years is probably pretty close, but but that was some of the something I did did hear from that rather than just put a, a time frame on it where you're constricted, maybe it should be better left as as regularly or or as needed. Okay. Commissioner Keel. Yeah, I think I agree that, you know, having some language in there on as needed um, is better. But... Okay. Mr. McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. So would you suggest just putting it at the end management plans will be reviewed on a 10 year schedule or as necessary or as needed? Would that work? That, that's fine or just take the just take the actual 10 10 year out of it so that it be regularly or as as needed okay. i mean i don't know if it makes a lot of difference to tell you the truth um i think i think, I think we have occasionally everything i mean regularly it does need to be and maybe that's why it's being changed now because it hasn't been reviewed regularly <laughs> so maybe you're trying to put a little pressure on yourself <laughs> to make sure to make sure you follow up on stuff but mike scott for the record the reason that that i asked for this to be added was because our uh, elk species management plan was finalized in 1997 and it's it's been in need of uh, a review and an update for probably 10 to 12 years and then the uh, bighorn sheep management plan finalized in 2001 2002 and same thing. So I just wanted to make sure we weren't going to go for 25 years on, on these plans that they would, you know, at 10 years, we're going to review them. If they don't need any, any updates, that's fine, but at least we review them and, and then finalize a new version. So, so the 10 years is kind of more directed at. Yeah. And at, I'm, at I don't, your, I'm not at, opposed, at yourselves. <laughs> I'm not opposed to the as needed because I think that could, you know, if, if there's some major change or right. something that needs to be updated, um, we can do that. But that was the whole reason. I just didn't want to go 25 years. Yeah, I think, I think probably the as needed should probably, because it could change, you know, yep. it may not, it may need to be reviewed after five. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner McNinch. You're good. Okay. Anybody else? Vice Chair Cavillia. I mean, I, I think you dad could add something like, I think you want to leave the 10 year minimum in or maximum in there, but management plans will be reviewed as needed, but no more than on a 10 year schedule or something along those lines. I, I definitely think you want to leave the 10 year time frame in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, seeing none, this is an action item. We'll go out for public comment on Commission Policy 21. Okay, anybody on Zoom? Okay, thanks. We'll Commissioner, bring it back. sorry, Chairwoman East. Yes. I did want to request that we add an S to the end of plan in the title before you guys make a motion. Oh, okay. The game and fur bear management plans. Okay. Yes, thank you. You bet. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve? Okay, I'll, I'll move to approve commission policy uh, 21 with the noted changes and I'll leave it up to you Kaylee to figure out where the, or as needed goes. Uh, do we have a second? We have a, a motion, a second by Vice Chair Cavilia. All in favor for forwarding commission policy 21 to the next meeting or a future meeting, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Weiss absent. Okay, 8D, Commission Policy 22, Introduction, Transplanting, and Exportation of Wildlife. First reading, APRP Committee Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The Commission will have a first reading of Commission Policy 22, Introduction, Transplanting, and Exportation of Wildlife, and may make any necessary changes and may decide to move it to a second reading. Thank you, Chairman East, Kaylee Musso for the record. The department updated commission policy 22 with a few clarifications and removed repetitive language. The committee also decided to add a term to the title. So the title will now be introduction, reintroduction, transplanting and exportation of wildlife. 
Um, and then I know a couple of cabs had comments on this policy as well, but they weren't exactly too clear to me. So I will let them speak to that if they would like. Um, other than that, any changes to this policy were just clarification changes. Okay. And I did get a call from um, Mr. Flowers, and I don't think he's here, but he asked us to consider changing the word may on page three in the second paragraph down. It says to give transplanted animals a better chance of establishment, predator control shall be accomplished by wildlife services or another appropriate entity before and after a transplant occurs. So that was just a request that I had, Mr. Scott. Does anybody else have questions, comments? Okay. Yeah, Mike Scott for the record. Um, I was at the Washoe Cab when this, when this was uh, requested and I don't have a problem with that. As long as you would change that to, um, to give uh, transplanted big game animals, because we do not tend to do predator control for upland game releases or things like that. So um, big game, I, I don't have a, a issue with, but um, I think that would clarify that a little bit for us. Okay. Madam Chair, yes. I, I might um, also add, I mean, if, if, if we're gonna make it a shall rather than a may, I think it would be incumbent that there's some scientific data or evidence that that, that <clears throat> would be beneficial and that we don't paint ourselves into a corner of requiring that in any and every instance that we're going to potentially transplant big game animals. So if, if the word is, is shall, um, then I think it would be incumbent to have science or data suggesting that there would be um, some benefit to the success of that release as a result. Okay, that's a good point. Vice Chair Cavillia. So, and I, I guess I, I kind of had the same thoughts as um, Director, Director Wasley that, because I, I think there's probably in, in, instances where we don't need the predator control. So if we need to add some languages in there that prior to the transplant, the department's going to make a determination on that. And if they believe they need it, then they shall. But I, def, I, I, got, I got some calls on that paragraph as well, but maybe we elaborate on that one specifically. Okay. Commissioner McNinch. And then we'll Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, and, um, I wasn't sure if it was the, the idea that you have to do predator control that these provided that opportunity or if there was just concern that it would be brushed by the wayside. So I did draft some language that incorporates what Tony just mentioned, um, you know, so that the expectation is, and we have had a lot of predator projects that we haven't done predator control because it was determined not necessary. Um, and then there's others where it has been very necessary. So um, I did, I did jot down some language just to get the ball rolling. I think we're already headed down that path. And what I had written was, um, I'll incorporate Mike's suggested change to give transplanted, uh, transplanted game animals, a better chance of establishment. The department must evaluate if predators pose a risk to the success of the transplant. If determined that predators do pose a risk, uh, pose a risk to the success of the transplant, uh, trans, I put transport transplant predator control must blah, blah, blah. Okay. And that was the language that I had drafted. To, so the expectation is, is that that evaluation is done, but, and, but predator control isn't uh, conducted unless it's found to be necessary. That was the, that's what I'm trying to articulate there. Okay. Yeah, Mike Scott for the record. One thing that I would add is that um, just exactly what director Wasley said um, that we do consider that, but in the, the big game release plan, that is addressed in the big game release plan. So it's actually, uh, there is a predator control um, efforts suggested or, or something along those lines. There is some language that addresses that in the actual plan when we, when we consider that at the very beginning. So if it's not necessary, that would be clear. Um, and that, which was why it initially said may. So uh, anyway. Trying to clean it up, I know. <laughs> okay. Mr. Jackson, did you have a comment? Uh, Pat Jackson, staff specialist. Uh, I, I just wanted to, uh, and, and Dave, I, I, I had the same idea as you. I would request or, or think it's a better idea to 
have a conversation on whether we should or should not based on not only biology, but also sometimes limiting factors. The I just learned this week that the uh, wildlife services employee that uh, predominantly does work for us and on 101 and 013 is, will be leaving wildlife services soon. And so there are times where uh, we, we can't have work done. And so uh, I, I would more want to make the decision based on biology and, and, and emphasize that the department should have that conversation. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, Commissioner Almberg and then Barnes. Yeah, no, I, I agree with uh, uh, Dave's his, his reverbage there. I, I think it's good. It covers the basis for me. Okay. Commissioner Barnes. Yeah, before Dave uh, provided us with his language, um, I was just going to say, doesn't May pretty much accomplish what we've been talking about <laughs> to begin with? It does. I mean, <laughs> As we as we step back, we're adding we're adding language, yeah. but what we're going to add to doesn't may doesn't may take care of it. Although I do like how, what Dave said to because it explains it a little bit better than just may. So that was my only comment. Okay, and, and that was the point of drafting a little something to to make clear the expectation or that what we would hope for as a commission that that evaluation would be done. I thought that maybe that would address the issue, but yeah. Well, in the big game release plan is the paragraph before, and if it's stated in the plan, I don't know that it needs to be stated in this as well. Yeah. But and I, I appreciate that. I did go around looking. I knew I, I knew it was somewhere. I didn't look in the big game release plan. I was looking in the other policies, and I, I remembered that verbiage somewhere, and I couldn't find it. So I thought, well, I'll draft this just to cover the base, but. You know, I'm good either way. I understand the concern and I don't have a problem with the uh, evaluation beforehand. And if it's necessary, we're right where we would expect to be. So it's not a, not a big deal that way. Okay. Okay. So any other questions? Should we go out for public? We'll go out for public comment. So any public comment in Washoe County, come on down, state your name for the record and you'll have three minutes. Hello, Fauna Tomlinson, Reno resident. I agree with May over shall because it gives the department the ability to be flexible if they need it, scientific. Um, shall also like years down the road, we, we may not remember this conversation and, and there may be, you know, you shall do this, you shall do this. And if, like Pat said, somebody's missing for a week, um, you know, just is too restrictive to put the word shall. So I also agree with May or what David said. Thank you, Commissioner McNinch. I mean, bye. Thanks, Pana. Any other public comment? Any cab comment? Any Zoom comment? Yes, Steve Robinson. Okay. Is he going to come up on the screen? No, just his voice. Well, Madam Chair. And commission, um, this is Steve Robinson from the Washoe Cab. Uh, this what we had some discussion at our cab meeting on this. And like uh, Mike Scott said, the, the May was put in there since um, bird transplantations. It would be you know illogical or unfeasible to remove the predators for those. That is mostly for big game. So that's why we proposed to give transplanted big game animals a better chance of establishment. Predator control shall be accomplished. Um, before and after big game transplants occur. And um, I do like uh, Commissioner McNish's addition to the scientific so that it, there's a survey done to see, to see the validity of it. But we wanted the, the big game either at the beginning and the end in the shell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Any other comment? Nope, okay, we'll bring it back for discussion. Anybody? Commissioner Barnes. Yeah, one comment, we're talking about big game and they said, you know, that if we're transplanting birds, we don't need it. Uh, I think that if we're transplanting birds, it's still, we still need to have it included because it's been a number of years ago, but um, Indow released a bunch of, uh, there were chucker and I can't remember what else behind the ranch. And the only thing left a week later were feathers. <laughs> <laughs> they. They just ran right up and down the road and the predators, there wasn't one left when we got done. So they didn't know how to protect. Yeah. So I don't think now. let's just don't, let's don't limit it only to uh, 
to big game animals. If, if we need to for transplanting birds, let's, let's leave it, that option open also. Okay, we have that option. Any other comment? Yeah, Madam Chair, just yes. uh, for consideration, I, I know that uh, historically the department has um, removed predators to ensure the success of turkey releases, for example. So it, it, there could potentially be situations where um, predator control be warranted to ensure the success of a, of a bird release. We also have instances where we have animals classified as big game that are sometimes transplanted, uh, for example, bears. Um, and so again, uh, having some clarifying language would, would be helpful. Um, okay. clearly, um, you know, there wouldn't be any reason to necessarily do predator control for the transplantation of a, of a bear. And we don't try to do that often, but, uh, that's where that, um, shall and big game, um, can create some unnecessary consequences. Okay. Thank you for the comment. Commissioner McNinch, can you read your, um, your suggestion again? for us sure and it, like again it's just to get the ball rolling so right. there's a better way to say it so that that paragraph would read um and i don't know i can change it to just game mike you suggested game um does that cover birds mm -hmm. okay so to give transplanted game animals a better chance of establishment the department must evaluate if predators pose a risk to the success of the transplant if determined that predators Pose a, do pose a risk to the success of, a, of the transplant. Predator control must be accomplished by wildlife services or another appropriate entity before and after a transplant occurs. Okay. And it's a little awkward, but I mean, it, it, there's, it can be cleaned up from there, I suppose. Sure. So I mean, yeah. that's probably a better way of saying it, but it captures a couple things. Any concerns, Mr. Scott? No? No, I, I, I think that that covers it. I was just going to suggest that there was some sort of inv investigation or, mm -hmm. or um, just exactly what you said. I think that that will work for us. Okay. Director Wasley, are we good with the language? Are you good with Commissioner McNinch's language? Are you okay with it? Uh, at, at first blush, yeah. I, I guess okay. I would, I mean, I, I don't know if we're, uh, preparing to, to take an action that would, you know, ensure the, um, but that's actually what's adopted, but I, I think it would be some benefit in just contemplating the scenarios, but it, yeah, as, as, as I hear that, there's no red flags that, that rise in my mind. Okay. And Madam Chair, if I could, I don't, I don't know that we're pressed for time on this. If we mm -hmm. need to bring it back to the commission and look at it again mm -hmm. with the new verbiage, that, that's not an issue. I don't think there's, this is, we're just doing our review. So, right. This is just the first reading. Yes. Yeah. Management analyst Kaylee Musso for the record. Yes, this is the oh, first is reading. First so we could, yeah. we definitely have to bring it back for at least one more, but it could come back even more if you guys need. Yeah. So I think maybe we uh, have you work with Ms. Musso to, update that and then bring it back at a future meeting. Yeah. Okay, that works. Okay, all right. Well, since we're not gonna take action then, we'll move on to 8E, which is Commission Policy 25, Wildlife Damage Management First Reading, APRP Committee Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a first reading of commission policy 25 wildlife damage management and may make any necessary changes and may decide to move it to a second reading. Thank you, Chairwoman East. Uh, Kaylee Musso again for the record. The department attempted to update commission policy 25, which is the wildlife damage management policy um, by removing any redundant language. A lot of this policy is covered in the um, management plan, and then also in policy 23, which you guys will see at a later time, but the department or the APRP committee is still working with the department to update policy three, 23. Um, and so uh, we are available for any questions on this. I know um, I've heard some of the cabs had questions on this policy as well as some commissioners. Okay, questions on policy 25. Commissioner Barnes. Yeah, I do 
did have some questions. Um, I guess when I initially read this, I didn't realize what was in policy 23. So mm. I understand that a lot of this is reflected in, uh, in policy 23. But as, as we move on um, in this policy, when it gets to uh, some of the, of the, the uh, permitting language for, for like private landowners that are, that are having issues that's crossed out, um, I would like, I'd like to see that left in there um, in case there's a landowner having issues with, with some kind of take on livestock or property where they can still get the, still get the permit to take care of what they need to. I don't want to lose that. Um, so I don't know if that's in another policy or, can, or if we could leave some of that um, in this one as well. Can you tell us which paragraph you're looking at? Is it identified as a number or something? Well, it's under, Procedure. under procedures eight. Uh huh. And um, there's, I think, what is it? Eight A, you know, that, that that's, that's redundant. Um, and then maybe even one, but when you get down to like like two and, and beyond, because a lot of this stuff okay. is repetitive and it, it needs it needs to be cleaned up whether we leave it in there or not. Mm -hmm. But that's that's what I'm referring to. Okay. Because I do know that you know as a, as a landowner, if you're having issues, they can, they'll give you a special permit mm -hmm. to take care of something. But I, yourself, but I don't I don't want to lose that because as it is now, it looks like it's like it's gone. So unless it's in another another policy or if we, or if we could somehow clean that language up to where it's, it's clear and concise, but it's still in there. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Um, I did talk with staff, staff specialist Pat Jackson and we are not aware off the top of our heads of that specific um, language is in another policy, but he did suggest making number seven that's crossed out um, to bring that up to eight and make it a new C. So then it would be under eight B. Um, I don't know if that would satisfy your concerns or if there's other numbers that you want to be included as well. Yeah, I'd have to look at a little bit, a little bit closer and, and maybe it's something that if we bring it, bring it again, we could work on, put some, put mm -hmm. some language in there and kind of work on it. But, but it is, it this, this whole policy is pretty wordy and there is a lot of redundancy in it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, if we could just work on cleaning it up, make it clear, concise, but but still leave the leave the intent and uh, the purpose and procedure in there. Okay. Any other questions, Commissioner Keel? Yeah, just a clarifying question, like in Section Eight underneath Procedure, why is it prescriptive to lions, ravens, black bear, or bobcats? I'm thinking, like, if there's an issue with beavers or foxes or other animals or is that covered elsewhere or? And thank you, Commissioner Keel. I might defer to someone from the game division to answer that for me. Sure. Mike Scott for the record. Um, we can, we could probably change that language to add, you know, other species in there. I don't know if we need to specify them directly or if we could use something that would cover them all. But uh, there's no, I, this is just, you know what was what was presented to us and sure we didn't make that change but um it's noted okay sounds good yeah i mean it, i just don't want to limit something if there's an, somebody else is having an issue with another species that we're not able to do something with but yeah okay good points others okay this is an action item so we'll go out for public comment here in washoe county any cab comment No cap comment. Okay, public comment on policy 25. Mel Belding, Washoe County on policy 25. Didn't get to speak on 22, so I guess we'll, we'll wait till that comes back. But on policy 25, um, I would like to see it added that you guys get to see not only the projects that are approved, but the ones that are disapproved and why. Um, there's a lot of projects being asked for um, and they've been turned down for many years. I, I think that should be added in this policy. Um, that's all I have, thank you. Okay, thanks Mr. Belding. Any other public comment in Washoe County or cab comment? 
Okay, seeing none, do we have anything on Zoom? Nothing on Zoom. We'll bring it back to the commission for more discussion. Sounds like we have some work to do. Would this be better off to go back to APRP or do you wanna bring it back to the commission? Well, it, we can certainly go back to the committee. That's not a problem. Um, we can work it out with some of those things there. Um, if there's some specific guidance that you, we wanna take care of here today, we can just keep it at the commission level. So otherwise I've got some, just some general notes, leave depredation stuff in and um, some really broad stuff um, mm -hmm. to address. If there's some specific language, then maybe we can work it through the commission still, but um, okay. it's not a problem taking it back to the committee either, so. What would you prefer, Ms. Musso? Uh, management analyst Kaylee Musso, for the record. I have identified um, language in two, four, and seven that I think might satisfy Commissioner Barnes if you guys are comfortable keeping it in the commission. Okay. Um, I'm comfortable bringing it back okay. with some suggested changes, um, leaving in language specific to the landowners that I think might appease you. Okay. okay. So we can, we can work, we can bring back something with that. Um, also take a look at the uh, other species causing issues such as beavers, um, mm -hmm. kind of evaluate that and uh, see if there's, if there's other ones that we need to add in there and incorporate. Um, so we can take a look at that. And then uh, with the public comment, um, you know, we can discuss that real quick. And if we want to incorporate something there, then we can do that as well. So, okay. Anything else? No. Okay. So I think we're going to bring this back to the next commission. We don't have, we won't take any action. Commissioner McNinch. I'm getting my eyes checked today. Okay. <laughs> so maybe I need to. Um, okay. So um, the, does the commission, would the, would the commission like us to address the um, predator proposals that are not being uh, forwarded for uh, suggested for implementation um, and ex explanations there? Is that something that we want to include in our policy? The expectation that, yeah, I'll leave Tom knows where I'm headed, I think. Commissioner well, Barnes, I, I don't know if it would the way the way we're we're working on this policy and what's in policy twenty three, if that language wouldn't be better addressed in policy twenty three instead of instead of this because that because policy twenty three talks more about the predator management plan specifically, mm -hmm. at least when I look when I looked through it the other day. So I, I'm almost thinking that 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 suggestion would would maybe fit better into policy twenty three. I don't know if somebody's more current on their policies than I am, but that I guess that's kind of what I what I'm thinking as far as as the suggestions is as to stuff specific to the predator predator plan and what uh, Mr. Belding brought up. Okay, okay. and it, and make that makes a lot of sense to me. So, um, and I know we didn't bring 23 forward. We're kind of talking about wildlife damage and stuff. Um, the department did bring a, a, a kind of a in betweener from what we started with to um, uh, what we had last time helping us clean up some of that language. And uh, the department uh, took the initiative to, you know, with our, with our um, collective, um, could not sure where we were gonna head with it at the last meeting. And they came back with another proposal that uh, in reincorporated a lot of the concepts that were in there, but really did a lot of cleanup too. So, um, so I think that there's something to work with there. We can take a look at that as part of 23. Um, we'll bring that back and um, it, yeah, and I think that we'll, so we can certainly do that. Kaylee, if you'll help me remember to take a look at that too. Yes, of course. Okay. Okay. That sounds, that sounds good. All right. Any other discussion on 25? Otherwise we'll see it again in the future. Okay. Um, commission policy 8F, commission policy 26, managing Rocky Mountain elk population. First reading APRP committee chairman, David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a first reading of commission policy 26, managing Rocky Mountain elk populations and may make any necessary changes and may decide to move it to a second reading. Thank you, Chairman East. Kaylee Musso again for the record. Uh, policy 26 is managing Rocky Mountain elk populations in Nevada. 
Um, the department did not have any changes to this policy, but the APRP committee did suggest adding the term reintroduction on page, at the top of page two in order so that this policy would match policy 22. And that's it for this policy. Okay. Any questions on policy 26? I don't see any. Okay. So we'll go out for public comment. Any cab comment on policy 26? Any public comment? Nothing, okay. Oh, hang on. <laughs> you should sit in front, Mr. Belding. Mr. Barnes might not want this one, but um, on <laughs> Mel Belding for the record, Washoe County. Um, uh, I would like to see sub plans be reviewed on every five years or something. Um, another thing, I believe the department should, uh, and the commission should actively in, engage in the expansion of elk herds where they can with all due respect and um, consideration of the other stakeholders in this. Um, some of these policies that we have sub plans haven't been reviewed since 99. And I think they need some review and there might be some room out there for some more elk. So um, I believe this is a policy it should be in. I certainly agree with Mr. Barnes about 23, but um, I, I think we need to take a deeper look into what we can do with the elk herds. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comment? Anyone on Zoom? Nope, okay. We'll come back to the commission. Any comment on the sub plans? Mr. Scott, do you have any thoughts on the, the public comment for sub plans? Uh, Mike Scott, for the record, um, with regard to sub plans, we are the 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 direction that that I was going to take was to update the uh, state um, elk species management plan first and and go from there and see if any of those sub plans do need review. I know there are, there has been some, some other requests to review them. And, um, but I would like to have the species management plan updated first. And we wanted to get through the bighorn management plan before we started the elk species management plan. So it's, it's lined up, but we're, we're just, we're trying to get through one at a time. Okay. Would it, what does the every five years do because if you're going to review the sub plans after you've reviewed the elk management plan and we just said 10 years give or take if it's needed what does the sub plan if pushing that five years what does that do mike scott for the record uh, madam chair as as somebody who used to manage an elk herd and deal with um, a, a five-year management plan it five years comes really really quick okay. and um there with the lincoln county plan it was it was written in two years and for us to revise it took three years and so it's it's not a a, a quick short process it tends to take quite a lot of time so that's why i was suggesting on our plans that a 10-year is adequate um okay. and it, and but the as needed comes in as well so um i i just I don't want to be forced to review them because it takes up a, a lot of uh, a lot of staff time. Okay. Other thoughts? No. Okay. Do we want to move this forward? Add language, not. Mr. McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, I, I hear. I hear Mel, um, mm -hmm. and I think that the way that we've got it handled in the thing, uh, every ten years um, or as necessary, you know. So if there's a need to evaluate something, it can be done. This isn't this doesn't preclude um, or, or exclude. I mean, there's opportunities. We're just saying that at least every ten years, we're going to open the book and take a look at it and see, you know, and do an evaluation. And so I think we've got it covered, and um, I understand the. Um, the desire to move elk into other areas. I, I think, um, I think our policies are, um, supportive of that. Maybe we're not getting overly, 
aggressive about saying we have to do it. Um, but I, I don't, I don't see that anything in our policies prevents that from happening. And I think those opportunities are there to pursue in other fashions and the door's not closed on that, um, regardless of what we do with our policy. So I'm not sure that we need to, um, you know, I, I just feel like those doors are open. I mean, they're pioneering into some areas now. I mean, they do all the time, it seems like, so. Okay. Anyone else? Do I have a motion to move this forward? Vice Chair Cavilia. And just real quick, I do think with what the, the language change we proposed in policy 21 mm -hmm. kind of resolves some of Mel's <laughs> concerns. Um, so with that, I'm gonna make a motion to forward policy 26 as presented to a future commission meeting. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Second for, from Commissioner McNinch. So we have a motion by Vice Chair Cavillia and a second by Commissioner McNinch to move policy 26 forward to a future commission meeting. Okay. 8G, Commission Policy 27, Protection of Wildlife, First Reading, APRP Committee, Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a first reading of, <laughs> what? So sorry, what am I doing? Oh, <laughs> uh, I took a Zyrtec this morning. <laughs> I, I feel like I've got like Benadryl brain, I'm sorry. Okay, so <laughs> we'll go back. Where are we? Uh, 26. <laughs> okay, so we had a we had a motion and a second. All in favor of moving Commission Policy 26 forward to a future commission meeting, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Wise absent. Sorry, you guys. Thank you for catching me. I I will not take a Zertec tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, moving on to 8G, Commission Policy 27, Protection of Wildlife, First Reading, APRP Committee Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The committee will have a first reading of Commission Policy 27, Protection of Wildlife, and may make any necessary changes and may decide to move it to a second reading. Thank you, Chairman East, Kaylee Musso for the record. So as you said, Commission Policy 27 is Protection of Nevada's Wildlife Resources. Um, the department did not have many changes to this policy we did update number five to say that the Wild Horse, Wild and Free Roaming Horses and Bros Act of 1971 as amended, um, just to match policy 67. If you guys will recall, we added the term as amended um, when referencing that act. And then number nine uh, was updated as there have been more sightings of wolves in Nevada. Number nine would now read, the commission recognizes wolf sightings will continue in Nevada like other predators, the commission supports management of wolves if they are determined to be negatively impacting other wildlife species. Um, and I do know there was CAB comments on this policy as well, but we are available for questions if needed. Okay, any questions for Ms. Musso? Okay, any CAB comment on commission policy 27? Okay, I don't see any. any public comment on Commission Policy 27. Mel Belding again for the record. On Policy 27, I, I realize it's probably two, might be 67 would probably have been a better one to put it in, I guess, but um, I would like to see that the department gives us an annual report of feral horses on public lands in Nevada and the possibility adverse effects that these introduced species are causing. And I, I'd like it, the department will actively advocate for AML. Um, I believe another part of this pol policy is on wolves, correct? Yes. Um, I would. It's number nine. I would urge, yeah. I would urge you to leave um, something in there about we're not going to put up with them whatever you might want to put in there but um we've had several sightings in the state of nevada now um washoe county in particular you had one on fox mountain that was was filmed um you had one in via that um one of the wardens went up there and verified that he was there we had six a pack on the bear ranch two years ago um so 
I, I think there's got to be something stronger uh, on this language. Nevada wildlife cannot afford another apex predator. And somehow we need to make it a little stronger than what this language is. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Belding. Any other comments in Washoe County? Okay, seeing none, Zoom? Okay, Mr. Robinson, Dr. Robinson. Yes, thank you, Chairwoman East. Um, at our CAB meeting, we were, that's one of our recommendations as we discussed leaving in the first sentence. Um, we, I know we were told just a couple years ago that Nevada couldn't support or, or herds could not support a wolf population. So we recommended to keep in it is the policy of the commission to oppose the establishment of a population of wolves in Nevada. And then go ahead and say, if they are here, a management of wolves, if they are determined to be negatively impacting other wildlife species can be managed. So um, that's, that's the one thing we'd like to keep in there just to have it as a policy to um, not have wolves in Nevada. Thank you. Thank you. Any other Zoom comment? No? Okay, we'll bring it back to the commission for discussion. Any discussion? Commissioner Barnes and then Commissioner Keel. Yeah, I guess when I was reviewing this, um, I, I did I did circle the what was crossed out to oppose the population of wolves in Nevada. That I thought that maybe that still needed to be needed to be left in there um, with the additional uh, added language. Somehow that's that will have to be reworked to make it read better. But but my my initial thought when I read this was to was was to maybe see if we could leave that in there, but. But then as I, I did read it, read it, you know, it gives us a, a policy to manage them. So, but I, I do think maybe it would be important that, uh, that we do oppose, oppose wolves in Nevada. I remember when we looked at this a few years ago, um, that was, we talked about a lot of different language, but we just basically, that's what we settled on was we just oppose wolves in Nevada. And it wasn't too many years ago that, that we added that in there. So. I think maybe it's mm -hmm. it might still need to be left in there with 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 what they added already. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Keel. Yeah, I would also be supportive of some stronger language in that paragraph that we've talked about. And very quick question for uh, Secretary Wasley. Earlier, you mentioned that that ten J exemption would that also be applicable to a species such as wolf? And if not to get completely off topic with the uh, commission it, policy. It, it has been used for uh, wolves in Arizona, um, I believe. I don't know how it would fit necessarily. I, I really don't know um, in terms of gray wolves and where we presently are with um, an effort to to relist them. And so as we talk about the language here and we talk about the state's management authority, or we talk about um, non-essential experimental population and where Nevada fits in wolf range and distribution historically, I, I have more questions than answers um, in, in terms of where, where we end up and what tools will be available to us, whether it be management or whether it be something, you know, like, like a 10J, but. Um, we can certainly explore all those options and make sure the commission is fully, fully aware of, of, of what the consequences of a relisting might be um, or delisting either way. Sure. Appreciate that. Okay. Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, no, I, I just would um, uh, concur with Commissioners Barnes and Commissioner uh, Keel on on leaving in that language um, that was originally li listed there with the uh, uh, opposition of a, a population of wolves. So I would definitely support that. Okay, thank you. No. Okay, Vice Chair Cavillia. And I'm in the same boat. Um, I would like to leave that a little bit stronger language in there. Okay. Looks like we've got some consensus here. Anybody else? No? Okay. Yes, Commissioner McNinch. I guess I could wait until we put a motion on the, the table, but, um, you know, this is one of those areas that, um, you know, in the 20, when we re last revised it and put the, the 
the you know the language in there that we wouldn't be tolerant of wolves in the state. Um, I voted against it at that time, and um, I guess it's it's time. I'm, I'm you know I'm kind of been pushing on um, <clears throat> who are we as a commission. Um, I hear all the time about how strong conservation conservationists we are, and and I, I completely understand that we've got a very dynamic, very diverse group of people up here representing different interests. So we're all coming from a little different angle. I understand that. But if we're really conservationists, the language as it's as it's presented today, what, what are we afraid of? Um, I understand, you know, the I understand wolves get in trouble. I get that. Um, people get in trouble. <laughs> Um, we've had a lot of situations like that. And so I understand that, um, but they're an important part of the ecosystem, whether we want to admit it or not. Um, if not for the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone, we wouldn't have Yellowstone, not with the wildlife that we're used to. Um, the only reason why that, that balance reoccurred, that, that, that Yellowstone got rebalanced was because of the reintroduction of wolves into that system. Um, they'd have largely been extirpated, and without that, there wouldn't be elk. <laughs> wouldn't be any elk. Um, they ate, believe it or not, they ate. Well, there wouldn't be neotropical migrants. Uh, a lot of other things. I'm, just, I'm just saying that it's a very connected system. Um, a lot of songbirds would have uh, disappeared from that ecosystem, which you know, just it just collapses. And I, so I understand the concerns, but. I guess I'm really challenging what, what are, when we say that we're for conservation and that we're for a balanced ecosystem, what are we really talking about? What are we, what does that mean to each of us? To me, it means that, that things like wolves have a place and um, that we find a tolerance for it uh, somehow. Um, and so that's what I'm advocating for is some kind of tolerance for them. I understand. I mean, we certainly are tolerant of the moose that are coming in. We're certainly tolerant of the, the condors that we talked about earlier. Um, um, so um, we haven't had any problem with, you know, uh, other populations that are moving in. It's just, it's the fact that we've got, um, you know, they do eat things, I understand that, but um, I'm not convinced still that they're going to, uh, to make a living here at the levels that they are in Idaho, Montana and Wyoming, or even Arizona. I don't see, I don't know. I, don't, I, I guess I'm not completely there yet, but those are my thoughts. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Any questions, comments? No? Do we have a, any movement on this? Do we wanna bring it back? Do you wanna see the section of to oppose a population in Nevada? Do you have a motion? <laughs> Commissioner Keel. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, and I, I get where Dave is certainly coming from. And I, you know, to a certain extent, he's right. And I, the language oppose a population of wolves is probably too harsh in my opinion, but I do think we need to come to some sort of compromise between these two sentences here. and. Um, if everybody's in favor, you know, I think we can leave that to the discretion of Kaylee or maybe the committee uh, to work through that. But um, I think that would be my direction. Okay. Okay. Well, I appreciate I that. I think, I think um, again, I'm using the term tolerance. We do it with our uh, compensation tag programs, our landowner programs. It's all the system realizing that every part of what we do is really a function of tolerance. And so, um, I appreciate the willingness to go there and talk about that. And we can certainly talk about it um, like we did before. Um, the, the language that was presented here, I think it was, uh, um, you know, I appreciate the department trying to find um, some ground that people could work on. And, um, but we're, I'll be glad to go back and work with Kaylee and or Mike or whoever else and see if we can find a, you know, really find a fine line there that we can work on and, um, we know what the other two options are. They're right there on paper. One's right. proposed, one's current. And uh, if we can split that hair a little bit finer, um, I'd be glad to take a shot at it. So if, if there's tolerance for that, I'd be glad to try it. If not, then maybe we're not moving forward today. I'll, I'll get off the horn. Okay. Commissioner Allenberg? Yeah, I just would like to echo uh, or agree with Commissioner uh, 
keel here is with his comments. Okay. Commissioner Barnes, would you be open to having it come back with different language? Yeah, let's let's look at it and then okay. we can we can argue about it in another meeting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody else? I mean, the way that it stands now is, you know, um, you know, it's it's largely what you guys would originally would hope for. So we're trying to, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to move off of that. So at least it's, I guess, the threat of, uh, you know, of something staying in place too long isn't really there for, for you know, a lot of the, uh, some, the you know, for, for you guys. Um, it is that way now. So uh, if there's an opportunity to move um, a little bit further, at least it is the way that you would hope for it to be at a, as a default, at least. And We'll see if we can find some language that works. So, okay. 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 I'm getting nods. Yeah, it sounds like. Okay. So, Kaylee, why don't uh, why don't you work with Commissioner McNinch to bring this back? Will do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're not taking action on 27. So we'll move on to uh, 8H Commission Policy 28. Transparency on quota setting, first reading, APRP Committee Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a first reading of Commission Policy 28, transparency on quota setting, and may make any necessary changes and may decide to move it to a second reading. Thank you, Chairman East. Kaylee Musso for the record. Uh, the department and APRP committee did spend a little bit of time attempting to update this policy. Um, as you can see, it was originally policy 26A. We would like to change that to 28 as it has no relation to policy 26 now. Um, and then we changed the title to transparency on quota setting because it used to just say transparency, but we wanted to be clear about what this policy is really addressing. Um, and then under procedure, you'll see is where all of the changes were made. Um, the first sentence would read, the department will make available to the public, including but not limited to posting on the website, sending via mail, or providing in, an in another electronic format, um, A, B, C, D, E. And then E was updated to say that the commission um, will, oh, sorry. The annual big game status book will be available electronically prior to the May commission meeting. Okay, any questions on commission policy 28? Mm -mm. Okay, so we'll go out for public comment. Any uh, public comment in Washoe County from CABS first on commission policy 28? Okay, any public comment? For the record, Mel Belding, um, on, on 28, it's always been in the past, we, we got to bound um, big game status book. And <clears throat> when you look at your website, which needs some work just so I can put it in there, it's very, very difficult to uh, get through that website. Um, this is now a draft for the um, big game status book for 2021-22. Um, I'm, I'm okay with looking at it electronically, but I think the commission needs a second look at the big game status book if and when something has changed. So you're gonna see a draft and I, I'm afraid that something can be changed for whatever the reason is, and you guys aren't gonna be aware of that unless someone brings it to your attention um, on the big game status book. So I would like you guys to have the opportunity and the public before that is a final draft that we get to see it and we can comment on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Belding. Any comments, any other uh, public comment? Anybody on Zoom? Okay, we'll bring it back to the commission. Have we, Mr. Scott, have we seen a draft of that before? We've always seen the completed book. 
Madam Chair, that members of the Commission, fine. Mike Scott for the record. Yes, we've always tried to have the status book printed before the, the meeting, but the, the time that it takes to actually print it from the time that we, you know, we edit it and then print it, the Washoe Cab has had their meeting. And so that's why I came to you earlier and said, can we provide this to you? I, I actually didn't want to provide it electronically before I wanted to do it after, but um, with with some of the uh, complaints that I heard, I we we tried to do it, um, get it on the website and have it electronically available to you. Um, but yes, we are going to edit some of that book. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time editing it this year just because we we put it on there. But there's a lot of redundant language. Um, we have uh, we we changed the format this year, and we have biologists that that. Uh, they they put they they really focus on habitat and they put mm -hmm. habitat in the survey section and they put habitat in the population uh, status and trend section and then they put habitat in the in the habitat section and so I I my intent is to go through and and remove some of the additional redundant language and then provide you with the paper copy uh, before June first July first I'm sorry okay so. But the commission has not had the ability to edit that document in the past. Is that what I'm hearing from Mr. Belding? Is that the commission would have the ability to edit that document in the future? Is that what you're you are meant saying, Mr. Belding? I'm sorry. For the record, Mel Belding, no. The commission has never had that opportunity. But I think what you need to consider is that this is the first time it's ever been done this way. So um, I kind of got heartburn with any editing going on. Um, we mentioned habitat, but we should, the commission and the public should be able to see what that editing was and an explanation of why. I mean, we, had, for the past, been coming to these meetings for a long time over 45 years and uh we've always had the book but now we don't have enough time to do it and just so you know tomorrow you'll 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 know a lot more of why i'm so concerned about this um but i think we should have the chance we everyone should have the chance to see what has been edited out and that's why i'm asking for this it shouldn't just be Okay, we're going to edit it. This is what these guys read before. Now this is the permanent record because I, I believe this goes to the federal aid and wildlife, doesn't it? Becomes a permanent record. So I think you, you should be able to see it. Okay, right. thank you for that clarification. Okay. Other comments or questions? Deputy Director Rob, did you have a comment? You look like you're sitting ready to say something. I think we're here. Okay. Uh, all this is predicated on the calendar that we've put together to have the application period start, the application period in, the draw go off, the draw results out. And that calendar has us scrunched about as tight as we can. And then we used to put out the book. And then a few years ago in this exact room, uh, the commission, Brad Johnston was chair at the time. They saw a different worksheet that the commission, that the department puts together for guides for us. And Brad said, that's exactly what I want. So that has changed our gears to give you a different document with different data set than the book. Uh, we really are crunched for time. And if you want to change those dates, we can do that, but I don't know what our customers want more. Do they want their results before Memorial Day weekend? Do they want them mid-June? All this stuff just stacks up between getting the survey data done, getting that stuff input, having the reviews, having the meetings. We don't have an extra one or two days, really. We don't. Uh, so 
if you want to change the calendar, we can start looking at that. But to get what is being proposed to have in everybody's hands, it's not going to happen in the time frames we currently have. So if we need to make tough decisions, we will, but I don't know what our public wants more, the results before Memorial Day so they can plan or a book in 20 people's hands that want it in their hands. What What is more important? Do we know that the public wants their their results before Memorial Day? I, I can check it off again for the record. Uh, it we get re, uh, comment on that quite often. Okay, that that is something that uh, as soon as we open the application period, if you look at Nevada Big Game Hunter, you look at anything. When the results come out, when the results come out, I'm. Right. I've, I've received two phone calls since the commission meeting started today, one from hunting full uh, and some others that when are results coming out? It's, it's the big game dance that everybody does. There's a Western big game dance that I put in for this state, get results in this state. And it informs me, put in for this. It's, it's all tied together and we've chosen our spot in that line. If we want to change that spot in the line to get more information, we can, but I I worry about some of the kickback by changing our spot in that line. Okay. And, and I know I get calls too. I've gotten calls about the, the results and I've gotten calls about the book. And so I'm just wondering, you know, yeah. which is, I get calls about the book in April. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure. And I understand the time crunch and I understand the staff time and I, um, I want to make it, you know, beneficial for everybody if we can. Uh, Commissioner Olmberg. Yeah, um, you know, I was when we we talked about postponing it. I was concerned about it, but the the what you brought forward here, it, as I was going through uh, other recommendations from the CABS, this is what I went to. This isn't a draft form. This is a, a final product. And uh, that's where I, I did all of my, I don't know about all the other commissioners, but that's what I use. I, I still went through the, 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 the draft status book or the, uh, as I usually do in more in depth, but I was, I was okay with that being draft because this isn't draft and this was extremely useful for me. So I do appreciate it. I do think it is better. It's more, it's, it has all of the pertinent information that we need. So, so I was good with it myself. Okay. Commissioner Keel. Yeah, I was actually going to make that a very similar comment tomorrow. What uh, Commissioner Allenberg said. I mean, to me, the um, a spreadsheet guy, but all the information that you know we used to have to pull out of that big game status book is easy to read. Um, we need to do some formatting and get some columns swapped around so it's the same page over page. But I thought that was a really good document. Um, that big game status book is certainly valuable when you look at long term trends, which can't always put on a single page here, but you know, I thought you guys did a great job with those recommendations forms and they are really useful. Okay. Anybody else up here? Vice Chair Cavillia? No, and I, I guess I kind of echo those guys. I was I was in that meeting with Brad when we saw this the first time. And I mean mm -hmm. for for me setting quotas, the, these sheets are more there's just more information as far as quota sitting. I think coming out of these sheets, I'm looking at the status book and it's just a matter of, I guess times are changing a little bit. And it was a matter of us requesting these. Um, and I do the big game status book is absolutely valuable, but for the process of the, um, what we're doing with quota setting, I think these are more valuable, the recommendation forms. Um, and I don't, I do not believe you want to push the drawback at all because you're, I mean, our hunts start August 1st, you know, and, and guys got to be able to plan and whatnot. So I, I don't, for me, I don't even see that as an option, you know, but those are my thoughts. Okay. Commissioner Rogers. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Really echoing the same sentiment. I think that that big game status book is an invaluable tool for, you know, for reference and, and to, uh, to get in the weeds on some of the things, but the data that was provided on the on the summary sheets, I felt was more than enough information to truly be able to make some informed decisions and uh, thought they were a valuable tool. Okay. Okay. So we've been deliberating. We're out of public comment. I'm sorry, 
Mr. Belding, we're back here. So do we have a, a motion on commission policy 28? What we're gonna do with this? Commissioner Keel? Yeah, I'll move to forward commission policy 28 forward to a second reading. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Keel. Do I have a second? I have a second by Vice Chair Cabilia to move commission policy 28 forward as presented. All in favor, raise your, raise your hand, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Weiss absent. I know I'm still thinking we're on Zoom. Uh, okay, moving along to uh, HI, Commission Policy 29, Elk Arbitration, first reading, APRP Committee Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a first reading of Commission Policy 29, Elk Arbitration, and may make any necessary changes and may decide to move it to a second reading. Thank you, Chairwoman East. Kaylee Musso again for the record. Policy 29 is the, as you just stated, is the arbitration process for applicants dissatisfied with elk incentive tag awards. You guys did get a little taste of this at your last commission meeting, uh, but the department did have no changes to this policy and we are recommending it be forwarded to a second reading. Okay, any questions? I don't see any, so we'll go out for public comment. Any public comment on uh, policy 29 from CABS? We'll open it up to CABS first. Okay, general public. Don't see any, we'll go to Zoom. Nothing on Zoom. So we'll come back on commission policy 29. Any, Commissioner Rogers? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If there's yeah, no more discussion, I'd uh, move to uh, make a motion uh, for approval of commission policy 29, the elk arbitration to uh, move to a second reading. Okay, we have a motion to approve and move forward commission policy 29. Do I have a second? I have a second by Commissioner Perini. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Weiss absent. Okay, 8J, Commission Policy 40, Statewide Boating Safety, second reading, APRP Committee Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a second reading of Commission Policy 40, Statewide Boating Safety, and may make any changes and may decide to repeal, revise, or adopt the policy. Thank you, Chairwoman East, Kaylee Musa for the record. Policy 40 is our statewide boating safety policy. We did update this policy to include paddle craft. So you will see anywhere the term boat is crossed out, we changed that to watercraft. Um, and then number nine was added by the committee, again, in order to just say that the commission supports the department's efforts on um, using life jackets as a life-saving measure. And the department is recommending this be approved as it is the second reading today. Okay. Any questions on policy 40? Okay, I don't see any. So we'll go out for public comment. Any cab comment? Any public comment? Any Zoom comment? Okay, we'll come back to the commission for a motion on to approve policy 40. Vice Chair Cabilia. I'll make a motion to approve approve commission policy 40 statewide boating safety as presented. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I have a second by Commissioner Barnes to approve commission policy 40. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Weiss absent. And uh, 8K commission policy 51, Wayne E. Kirch Conservation Award, first reading. APRP Committee Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a first reading of Commission Policy 51, Wayne E. Kirch Conservation Award and may make any necessary changes and may decide to move it to a second reading. Thank you, Chairman East, Kaylee Musso for the record. The department and APRP committee did update Commission Policy 51, the Wayne E. Kirch Award um, to reflect a mechanism for keeping um, previous nominations as part of a record, um, a historical record. And then 
at our last committee meeting, the committee requested um, in number five that to add the language or other appointed family member after Marlene Kirch, um, just to just to keep that going um, throughout time. I know you guys requested us um, send that to her for her approval. We did do that, but I haven't heard anything back yet. So um, I'm not sure. This is only a first reading for this policy, so we can move it to a second reading if you'd like and um, try to get in touch with her again. Or um, if you guys want to hold it just until we hear from her, then we can do that as well. Okay. Any questions on Commission Policy 51? Okay, any uh, CAB comment? Any public comment? Any Zoom comment? Nope, okay. I would be okay with bringing it back for a second reading as long as you've made you know every effort to reach her and she's comfortable with this. Okay. I don't know how everyone else feels, but yeah, okay. So with that, yes, Commissioner McInch. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think the only, the, the only reason why I think that was proposed was, um, you know, so that we didn't, I mean, it's a policy anyway, but mm -hmm. it just kind of left the door open to, to continue the, the tradition with the, the Kirch family. So um, we just kind of recognize that, um, you know, we appreciate that Marlene is doing it, but if another appointed family member does it, we appreciate it just the same. So right. I think that's the whole idea behind that. Okay. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve or move forward policy 51? I'll, I'll move to approve it. I'll move to forward policy 51 to the next commission or a future commission agenda. Do I have a second? I have a second by Vice Chair Cavilia to move policy 51 forward to a future commission agenda. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Weiss absent. We are almost done. Okay. Uh, am I right? Okay. 8L Commission Policy uh, 63. Protecting Wildlife from Toxic Ponds, third reading. APRP Committee Chairman David McNinch for possible action. The commission will have a third reading of Commission Policy 63, Protecting Wildlife from Toxic Ponds, and may take action to repeal, revise, or adopt the policy. Thank you, Chairwoman East, Kaylee Musso, for the record for the last time today, I hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> policy 63 is up for a third reading today. Um, we did not have any changes previously, but at our last commission meeting, so the second reading, um, there was a request to add number six under the policies mm -hmm. portion so that it would read an annual report will be provided to the commission on wildlife mortality. Um, and that's specific to toxic ponds. So if you guys have any questions, we are available. Any questions? Nope. Okay. Any cab comment? I think we had cab comment on this. No. Public comment? Policy 63? Okay, any Zoom comment? All right, I'll bring it back to the commission for a motion to approve. Chair, <laughs> Chairman, Commissioner oh, Rogers, no. oh my gosh. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> my brain. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Rogers. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, if there's no more uh, discussion, I would like to uh, make a motion uh, for approval of Commission Policy 63, at, which is the uh, Protecting Wildlife from Toxic Ponds as written. Okay, I have a motion to have a second. I have a second from Vice Chair Cavilia. So we have a motion to approve. Commission Policy 63 as presented. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Wise absent. Madam Chair, could I just kind of make a comment before we close out this agenda item? Sure. Okay. Commissioner so, McGinch. you know, there was a, there's these, you know, there's a lot of work that's going into these and it, it involves a lot of department staff and, uh, um, you know, we, we held our committee meeting a week in advance to try to kind of soften the this week a little bit. Um, but I know that Kaylee's week uh, 
last week preparing for that meeting. She had a very big trip to DC this week where I know that she had a, an awful lot to prepare for and then to put together. And I ended up with this little note after all of that helping Dave because everybody knows he could use some help kind of streamlining <laughs> what we've done and stuff. So Kaylee, I really appreciate the effort. I know this is happening throughout the agency. Um, it takes a lot to do these things. And I know that we, um, that it can be overwhelming with our agenda item, but the work that goes on behind the scenes, not just with just with this stuff, but um, Kaylee, so I appreciate all your work on this. And, uh, and I know that there's so much more of it going on in the agency. So I just wanted to recognize that we know you guys have got a lot to do and, and um, you took a lot of extra steps for us. I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner McNinch. Um, but yes, you are correct. I really could not do this without the rest of the department staff. Thank you, Ms. Musso. Okay, that is the conclusion of our business for today. We have public comment, so we'll uh, move on to agenda item number 11, public comment, period. Public comment will be limited to three minutes. No action can be taken by the commission at this time. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Do we have any public comment? Mel Belding, for the record, um, <clears throat> I'm kind of confused. Um, I did not ask for the book to be completed. Um, what I simply asked for was that you guys got a shot at looking at it. I, I, I don't understand Deputy Director Rob's um, position on this or you know why he wants it. Uh, we're going to have the draw that the we got to put in our tags by the 10th. We're going to have a draw at the end of the month. But this book was always intended to come out in July. So how can this possibly hold up the draw? I don't understand why we want to put a spin on something. It is not, it, it, it's not going to hold up the draw at all. And I realize now it's water under the bridge, but that book was going to come out. The book is supposed to come out in July two months after we draw the tag or a month and a half or whatever it is. It's certainly not going to hold up the draw. Thank you. Any other public comment in Washoe County? Anybody on Zoom, Missy? Nope, okay. That concludes our meeting for today. We'll be back here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We'll see you all then. And I promise not to take a Zyrtec. <laughs>